Shalom, 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 shalom. Okay, I totally didn't tag anybody tonight. <laughs> Usually I send out little messages, but I think you guys are starting to realize we'll just do it at 7 Mountain Standard Time. We're going to wait for some peoples to get on here. Um, hello, hello, Kimberly. Hello, hello. Yeah, I didn't even send out. <laughs> I'm like, I think people are starting to realize it's just at 7. The only night I probably won't do it at 7 p.m. is on Sabbath night because we'll already do the morning one. So I'm blaming all. But how was your day, sweet girl? Were you working today? It's it's Wednesday. Hi, D. Shalom, shalom. We're going to talk tonight. Somebody specifically asked in a question, and we're going to stay focused. I'm going to stay focused. Do you get me? <laughs> I'm not going to answer questions till the end after we start it. Um, and we're going to talk about how the church system is based on Babylonian mythology. Somebody asked that question, and they also asked uh, one other question is, how, you know, where in scripture do we see that there's no pre-trib rapture? And so we're going to go through those two things tonight. <laughs> and hi, guys. Hi, RJ. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, D. Hi, Teresa. Hi, guys. So we're going to, um, I am doing well. I am a little frazzled tonight. Today, I had two, <laughs> I had a newborn session yesterday. Newborn sessions take three to four hours. Then you have to clean up and stuff. And then I had another family session last night. I had another family session today. But now, night is not night. Night is like, we have to start the session at three o'clock. <laughs> So it's like, it throws me off because in the middle of the day, I got to stop and go do a session. And it's like, because I'm going to lose daylight. <laughs> Cause like in the summer, I'm starting my photo sessions at seven. Like right now in the winter I, or in the fall, I start, I'm like at six. And so <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm a little frazzled. Hi, Jenny. Um, hi, Joe. Hi, Gr hi, um, Catherine. How's everybody doing? Um, but anyway, so somebody had asked him this morning about very specifically to go over the Babylonian. Hi, Dan. <clears throat> You're going to stick with us, right? We're going to go over how the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, the modern Christian faith, faith is Babylonian. And we're going to go over how um, there is no pre-trip rapture. We're going to go through scriptures of that. Somebody asked to go through that, and I thought it was a good study because a lot of you, hi, Susan, a lot of you, <clears throat> everybody's, Everybody's at different stages. So some people are going to hear this again, but I think every time you hear scripture, something new comes alive for you. At least for me, I could, <clears throat> I could listen to people talking about the Bible who actually are <laughs> like talking about the Bible, like and, and stuff forever. Like, cause I'm always going to learn something. I love it. Shalom, shalom, Steve. Shalom, shalom, Audrey. Okay. So we're just going to wait a few minutes till everybody gets on. I'm drinking <clears throat> my amber sun. I found my turmeric, turmeric amber. The new me has a tea that I started drinking years ago when I had my health food store and it's called amber sun. I just drink it for drinks. I don't do these things to heal me, but it's turmeric ginger and it's so good. If you want like the best tea in the world, hi faith. If you want the best tea in the world, it's new me's. It's called amber sun. This is the amber sun one. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and I'm kind of cold. Our basement, my husband and I are hot blooded anyway, so we keep our house cold. So the basement's really cold. <laughs> the podcast episode that talked about Nimrod was awesome. Oh, awesome. Did that with the one you listened to today, Angela? Um, is your husband okay? No, he is not well. He is very, 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 very sick. So please pray for him. He's um, in bed right now. I just made him, I made chicken noodle soup. Thank God for butchered chickens. I butchered, I only butchered like 40 this year. Some years I do 100, but I do it all alone. <laughs> And they have a three compartment sink. And so I like go whack off the head and then I put them in buckets and let them sit in the water. So the feathers start getting soft. And then I take them over and pluck the feathers on the plucker. But I mean, oh my gosh, I'm getting older and doing that whole process. So I only got, I think like 40 done this year, but thank God I had one for him. <laughs> I put it in there. So he's got chicken noodle soup. Hi, Donna. Hi, Kimberly. Oh, I'm seeing the, the same people. Yes. Um, please pray for him. Hi, Nelly. I'm rebounding. Ooh, to clean my lymphatics. Yes, your breathing. Okay, perfect. I'll keep praying for you, sweetie. Um, Shalom, good because I talked to the pastor twelve, and he is a preacher. Okay, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna go through those things here in a bit and, and talk about because there is no pre-trip rapture. That's the theory that was made up in the 1830s by somebody I can't never remember their name, <laughs> but they're a Pentecostal. They were a Pentecostal, and they decided, wouldn't it be convenient if the church gets to go away? <laughs> And, and so we'll go over so many things like that. Okay. Um, let's see. And terrifying. Yeah. The podcast. Okay. I'm glad. Um, 
You thought the, the podcast was terrifying? Oh, because the things that were in it and what we were doing? Yeah. Um, okay, so Nelly, we're just waiting a few minutes until everybody pops on. Usually about 7, 15 we'll start, but we will start praying here in a minute. Hi, Deborah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jean. So we're going to start. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Donna. I said, hi, Melissa. <laughs> oh. um, so no, Darby did not ask me. Is that what you're asking, Dee? Darby. Oh, Darby, Darby, Darby. Yes, Darby was the guy's name. Wow, sometimes I amaze myself at how <laughs> clueless I can be. Because I'm like, no, Darby didn't ask me to go over <laughs> the, the, the fact there's no preacher rapture. <laughs> You're right, it was Darby the person. <clears throat> I really amaze myself how clueless I can be sometimes. Dan, don't say a word. <laughs> Hi, Tristan. <laughs> so my big brother Dan's on here. And he <laughs> he's, can be ornery. Right, Dan? He can be ornery. Okay, guys. Well, we're just waiting a few more minutes for everybody to hop on. Um, had a really good cool thing happen tonight. Really awesome. Um, we did a family. So I did... Okay, who all loves babies like me? Ooh, raise your hand, babies. Um, so I had a newborn session yesterday morning. I had a family session last night with a 10-day-old... <laughs> thank you, Dan. I had a 10-day-old baby who was um, at that session. And then today it was an 8-year-old, eight 8-day-old eight baby. Like... So it was like two, three babies under 10 days old in two days. Like, that's awesome. Hi, Aaron. Uh, isn't that awesome? Um, shalom, shalom. God is doing great things. God, okay, good. God is connected to people who are genuinely asking questions about Christians need to uphold the law. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. And we're going to talk tonight how there's no pre-trib rapture, and we're going to talk about how the modern Christian faith is based on Babylonian tradition. So I wanted to just wait a few minutes. I know... I don't see Danielle. She's usually right on here. And, um, and, and yeah, whoever's laughing at Dan, he knows. Dan and I, yeah, we could cause some trouble. <laughs> thank God for repentance. <laughs> we were talking today. He called me. I was like, I'm thank God for second chances. <laughs> thank God for second chances. Um, that's beautiful about the testimony. Um, Oh, did I miss something, Kimberly? You said that you're sorry. What happened? Oh, my sister just missed. Oh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, and Angela, with everything you told me today, too, we're just going to pray for him. Hi, Marina. Shalom, everybody. So I'm going to wait just a few more minutes. Does anybody have um, any other testimony, any other thing um, that they want to share? Anything? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just going to wait a few minutes here. Um, yeah, God is good. God is good. So we, I had, you know, guys, it's like coming out of the woodworks, these people. And so, you know, just, just, I'll just chat here while we're waiting for everybody to get on for the Bible study. I mean, you know, 20 to 30 years ago is when the first movement of the people started waking up, the return of Ephraim, the turn, return of the 10 northern tribes of Israel, the return of the people saying, why aren't we following the law of God? We need to follow God's laws. Like, we're not saved by it, but there's an obedience factor to the relationship of God. We need to, if we love him, we keep his commandments. And then the father kept telling me there was a second group coming, which the scripture says he didn't have to tell me. Hi, Danielle, shalom. We were wondering where, you, I was wondering where you were. Um, and so in 2012, the father had woken me up one day and said, the second group's here. This is the daughter of the woman. And then a couple of weeks ago, the father said, cast in your net one more time. And I had been praying, Father, you know, you know the story. I said, Father, show me the 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Please, Father, if I do speak your truth and, and, and if you find that me trustworthy to help them, would you just bring them, Lord, so we can get them set free? <laughs> and I went to bed with like 2,700 followers and I woke up and saw exactly 7,000 followers and then it changed to 7,001. So I know you guys are called chosen and wanted. Hi, Amanda. Um, when you were talking about the two witnesses the other night, I fell asleep and had a dream that a Catholic priest killed them. Right? Joe, you're, that's probably exactly prophetic because remember the dragon makes war with them and, and, and there's the false prophet and the and the beast working together. And we know that part of that is the Catholic Church. Um, and he is going to kill them. They, they're killed, at, remember, for three and a half days. That's, that's Yahweh speaking to you. Hello, Jamar. Hello, guys. Okay, you're making a post and don't didn't realize the time was ha, ha, ha. I get that. I get that. I get that. <laughs> I got done with the session tonight, another newborn baby, and then I was I got it, everything uploaded, and I had to message my other clients, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's, 
<laughs> 651, <laughs> get downstairs. <laughs> awesome, guys. So we're going to wait just a minute here. Hello, Angela. Hello, hello. So we're going to wait just a few minutes here. And we're going to start going through tonight how there's no pre-trib rapture. And um, we're going to discuss the Babylonian origins of the modern Christian faith that does not look anything like the biblical faith. And so I pray, Father God, would open our eyes and hearts. I want to wait just a few um, I was attacked in the spiritual. Oh no. Did you have one of those dreams where you couldn't speak? Like where you had the demons like choking you? Because especially as you come to the truth, you will have, sometimes you'll have dreams where you'll literally be being choked by Satan. You'll have to, it happens to almost everybody I know. Because you got to remember, you're not a threat to the kingdom of God, of Satan. You're not a threat to the kingdom of Satan when you're disobedient. Because, because just believing in Jesus doesn't defeat demonic strongholds. Just believing in Jesus doesn't do things, but believing in Jesus and having the faith that commits you to works of obedience, that is how you defeat strongholds. So like when you're obedient to God, you're setting people free because you're helping them become obedient to God and Satan can no longer have them shackled in chains of sin. So when you turn your life to God, when you fully start obeying, you become attacked more than ever. Because if you don't help people get free from sin, Satan's like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm got, I've got him trapped in sin. You have a horrible connection tonight. Oh, is it bad for everybody? Um, oh, I'm sorry, sweet Kimberly. Yes, so Heather, that's going to be, yeah, that's Yahweh warning you something's going to be coming after you. And especially, the, remember you said the connection uh, remember the phone thing and stuff, and I, I knew very strongly you were going to be attacked um, when, you, when you kept telling me that stuff and the phone was having that. I had a dream last night that I lost my voice for a moment. Okay. Yep, Satan's always... Yep, and Tristan, you understand. Okay, so that wasn't... <clears throat> okay, good in Jersey. No, no. Okay, so good. So yours is freezing, Audrey, but everybody else's is great. Um, so it, I have full Wi-Fi so I don't know if, Audrey, if you want to restart it or if you just want to keep going. Um, and just, Father God, please, Father God, in the name of Yeshua. And Audrey, because you're the one who has, like, if, 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 right. So if you're the one who wants to know, then, of course, Satan doesn't want to he have you to hear because then you'll be prepared for tomorrow. Hi, Jenna. Hello, 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 Margaret. Oh, hello, everyone. Okay. Oh, my gosh, Audrey. You were attacked twice today. Okay. Well, Audrey, then that's, this is interesting because that would make sense because you're getting ready for a meeting tomorrow to defeat some of the lies of Satan. You're going forward and here's the enemy coming against you. That's how spiritual warfare works, right? So your phone is freezing so you can't get the truth. Your Yahweh, just in the name of Yeshua, we ask, Father God, that you would rebuke those demons that would be attacking her, Father God, that you would rise her up, that you would help her to hear every single word right set God on her phone right now, set God on everybody's phone so they hear your truth, your truth. Father God, you are master of everything. Lord, you command even the airwaves in your name. So, Father God, please, we ask that you would let everything be perfectly clear. For your glory, the name of Yeshua, bind and rebuke the demons of Satan, and let only your truth come forward, and let it come forward mightily, that it, whew, that it just defeats the enemy in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So we're going to keep praying. We're going to keep praying. Um, testimony the Lord has had me in the Old Testament. And then my friend found you. Oh, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You're good. Hmm. So a few people are freezing. A few. Yeah. So far. But mine, I've got like full Wi-Fi. And so some of you are saying it's good on your end. So then it must, I'm a assuming it's the other end um okay guys so we are at i started trying to start at 7 15 we are yeah we are so much bigger you got it we're gonna pray here we're gonna start we're gonna need one more minute because i know audrey was gonna come out and come back in so we'll give her a minute to come back in because she was specifically the one who asked the question um i think it's very important for everybody to know because if you are if you're going to go to battle and you are in boot camp you are preparing for battle but if you're sitting on the couch watching TV, okay, perfect. If you're sitting on the couch and you're watching TV, <laughs> you're not going to be fit for a marathon, right? But if, if you train every day and you're running 12, 6, 18 miles, whatever it is, if you're training, you can run the marathon. But you can't run the marathon if you've been sitting on the couch eating potato chips and candy. So spiritually, what the Christians have been fed is a lot of spiritual lies, a lot of candy-coated half truths and spiritually they're very lukewarm spiritually they're very not prepared for what's coming and so if they believe in a pre-trip rapture and that they're i mean i i have never seen a more unholy set of people in my entire life than the current generation 
and yet they think they're the ones who get to escape the tribulation because they're so good? Like, what kind of perverse world or what kind of distorted reality do you live in? Like, I've never seen a more wicked time. I've never seen a church more full of sin ever. Like, gay pastors and gay clergymen and homosexual like nobody turning anybody from sin you can come you can go to church if you're having sex outside of marriage you can like just sit there and nobody turns you from the wrong ways you get what i'm saying like what period in time have we have had a less holy group of people i don't think we have i, well, I know we have it because what does the bible say in the end times the wickedness will increase right um so no, Nellie, we're going to actually address very, because somebody has a meeting tomorrow with her pastor. So we're going to address two very specific questions. Hi, Rita. So <clears throat> the first question was, is how is the modern Babel, modern church system based on the Babylonian mythology? Okay. When you read the whole Bible, starting in Genesis chapter one, <laughs> I don't know how many hands I have, but I have three pens down here. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So when you read the whole Bible, starting from Genesis chapter one, all the way to the end. The arrogance and pride is so strong in Christians. You, I know, I know, it's so sad. And it's like, if you see, I try to delete the really bad comments, but, but it, it's rampant, it's, it's disgusting. And they, they, they keep calling me arrogant. And I'm like, yeah, I, <laughs> obeying the law doesn't make you arrogant. <laughs> obeying the law really humbles you. But if we look from Genesis, all the way through the end of scripture. What day is the Sabbath? Do you get to pick? Do they get to pick? Do you get to pick whatever day you want to rest? Jesus is our Sabbath. There's not, first of all, that's not one place in the Bible. Second of all, what in the world? What? 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 Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Oh my goodness, Why I was praying inside and asking God to leave and I forgot to pray out loud. Let's pray together. <laughs> She's Louise and I was praying all day, of course, but um, I just realized I'm sitting there and the Lord's like, you didn't pray together. I'm like, right. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Yahweh Elohim, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are so good. You are so great. We ask you to come and teach us tonight your truth, your ways. Open the eyes, ears, and hearts of your people to understand. Let the connection, let the pathways of, of your truth be open. Don't let the enemy stop any one from hearing your truth, Father God. May our hearts be prepared with good soil that we will readily absorb the word of you and that it will grow and that we cannot have weeds in our soil of our heart, that we would have good plants, that we would have good fruits and bear good, all of the fruits of the Spirit for your glory, Father God. Please come and teach tonight. Please lead tonight's teaching. Please, Father God, for all the people that we've been praying for, for the lost children, for the, for the family members that need salvation, for healing amongst every person in this place, Father God. We ask, Lord, that you would mightily and in your mercy grant your, grant your mercies to those people so that they would have the healing, they would have the deliverance. And Father God, set guard over your people for your name's sake. Please provide financially and spiritually for every single person as is needed, Father God. Please help us to let go of all strongholds in our life. If there's anything displeasing to you, please take it away so we only have you and our eyes are on you. We are single-eyed like a dove. Father, give us the heart that would worship you, glorify you, and do everything for your glory. We beg you for healing. We beg you for mercy. We praise you for all the good you do. We thank you for everything you are. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, beautiful. Now, we all know Genesis chapter 1. Hello, everybody. Who's, okay, what are the two questions tonight? The two questions are, there, okay, the, she had asked, where are the scriptures showing that, you know, basically where's there no, where is it talked about where there's no pre-trib rapture? And then like the, she just wants to know like the Babylonian origins of the faith. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what's your pastor? Yeah. So let's go through this. So, so Audrey, your pastor is going to say, look, we're no longer, and please go read, go listen to the Romans teaching we did last week. Okay. That would really help you. I know it's long but please go listen. The Galatians, I have a podcast that went, goes through Galatians. The Father had me jump ahead once to do that for people. Both of those books prove that we are to obey the law. We went through 1 Corinthians last week, and for, or was it already two weeks ago? I think it was last week. 1 Corinthians, um, what is it, 7 verse 9, um, 
7 verse 19 literally says, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, that doesn't matter. All that matters is keeping the commandments of God. <laughs> like, I'm like, where do they, how do they miss this verse? It's because they'll parse verses and they'll twist things out of context, try to say you don't have to obey the law anymore. But to be under the law, according to the book of Romans, it means you're breaking the law. When you are breaking the law, you're under arrest, so to speak, by the law. But if you obey the law, you're dead to the consequences in the law. Because if you are obedient to the law, there's nothing standing against you. Because the only thing in the law that's against you is when you break the law. Therefore, when you do not break the law, because the Holy Spirit leads you in obedience to the law, you are not under judgment of the penalty of the law. But if you blatantly break the law, even the least of the commandments, there's going to be some form of penalty to you. Like Isaiah 65 and 66 says, when Yeshua comes back the second time, those eating swine's flesh will be destroyed. Okay, that's like, I would say, one of the lesser important laws because it doesn't focus on faith or mercy or justice or love, correct? But Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 5, he who breaks the least, okay, he says this, I did not, do not think I came to abolish the law, but to fulfill. Therefore, not one jot. Okay, so he doesn't stop right there at the word fulfill. He goes on to explain what it means. Therefore, not one jot or tittle of the law pass away until heaven and earth pass away. Do you know in Hebrew, if you go to a Jewish man on the street and you say, do you abolish or fulfill the law? This is a Hebrew idiom. If you're outside of the Hebrew culture, of course it doesn't make sense in American culture. But this is a Hebrew term. If you go to America or to Jerusalem, you say that. If they are obedient to the Torah, they would say, I, I fulfill the Torah. If they, are abol if they are secular and do not obey it, they say, I annul, I abolish the Torah. And actually, it's the religious people who say that they are abolishing the Torah if they don't obey it. But that is a Hebrew idiom. And so Yeshua says, not, okay, until not one jot or tittle of the law pass away until heaven and earth pass away. This is Matthew 5, verses 17 through 21. And he says, and therefore he, therefore he who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And he who does and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, having that premise and understanding our Messiah's own words and heaven and earth did not pass away when he died and rose from the dead. Isaiah 65 and 66 is talking about the second coming of Messiah. It is talking about the tribulation and then the new, the, the new heavens and the new earth. Go read it for yourself. Isaiah 65 and 66. Those eating swine's flesh will be destroyed. So when God says in the book of Micah, he is a God that does not change. And we better believe him at his word. Daniel 7.25 warned that the Antichrist is going to be the one who tries to change God's times and laws. Not God. God says, I'm not going to change. Deuteronomy 13. So I'm giving you a whole bunch here, Audrey. If I'm going too fast, just tell me to slow down. But just write down these verses. Deuteronomy 13 says, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, let's go and serve other gods. Like, right? Let's go and serve other gods and let's not obey the commandments of God. The Bible says that person was sent to test you. This was the test by which Yeshua and Paul and every other disciple would have been tested. If any of them had taught against the Torah and said, let's go and serve other gods, like with Christmas and Easter and do all those things, they would have been a false prophet. But the reason that Paul and the disciples could teach about the Messiah from the Torah is because Messiah did not break the Torah. He did not teach against the Torah. The Torah shows us the need for Messiah and God didn't change. God is not going to change. And if you believe in a God that changed, you better fear for your life. Because if God changed his mind at the cross and decided nobody needs to follow the law anymore, then God could change his mind again and not come back to get you. I know and I serve a God who does not change. My God said the nature of sin did not change at the cross. Okay? That is extremely important to remember. The nature of sin did not change at the cross. What changed at the cross was the payment for our sin. 1 John 3, 4 and Romans chapters 3 through 6 very specifically says, sin is transgression of the law. That means contradiction to the law. Okay, if we need a savior today, I hope this is all making sense, Audrey. I wish your pastor was right here. You might just want to show him this video. <laughs> I don't know, man. This is, I feel the spirit. Do you guys feel Yahweh here? Like, whoo! I mean, things just keep coming out of my mouth. Praise Yahweh. <laughs> 
Where's my brothers and sisters who know how to shout that hallelujah? <laughs> okay. Okay, so if the nature of sin changed at the cross, we've got a God who changed his mind, but it did not change. My God did not change. My God will not change. Do you know if you go back to Exodus 12, verse 49? Exodus 12, verse 49. You guys, I'm going to read through these again. This is to get it seared in your mind. So every single person on the street, you don't even have to think twice. You can just regurgitate because you know the scriptures. Exodus 12, says Exodus 12 verse 49 it says let me find the verse one law shall be for the native born and for the Gentiles who dwell among you that's hot right there that sizzled that pastor's thought process that it was only for the Jews <laughs> let's go over here let's go to numbers chapter 15 man God's word is good <laughs> okay Numbers 15, verse 29. <laughs> you shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native born among the children of Israel, and for the Gentile who dwells among them. Woo, there's a go again. Let's keep going. Leviticus 19. So is this law just for the Jews? Is the new, oh my goodness, Audrey, I made a video a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago. I don't know how long it was now, a month and a half. It says the New Testament just for the Gentiles and the Old Testament for the Jews. And we just proved that immediately. Like it was so, it was such a good study that day. It's kind of what we're doing today. Okay, Leviticus 19. I went the wrong way, sorry. Leviticus 19, verse 33. And if a Gentile dwells with you in the land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger, the Gentile who dwells among you, shall be to you as one born among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Did you know Caleb was a Gentile? Did you know Caleb wasn't a Jew? But Caleb, a Kenazite, got grafted into Israel and became one of the two people to go into the land of Israel. Caleb, a Gentile. Joshua was a blood Israelite from the tribe of Ephraim. But Caleb became a leader of the Jews and became, he got a portion in with Judah. You know why? Because he believed in God. Did you know Abraham wasn't a Jew? Abraham wasn't an Israelite, was he? What did they have? They had faith that produced works of obedience. He became a Hebrew, a crossed over one. Abraham was called out of Babylon, Ur of Chaldea. All of you listening, all of you are being called out of Babylon, the end time Babylon. Do you guys understand that? Okay, now, so that was Leviticus 19. Wow, that's three, just, just quick off the top of our heads. You can find so many more, three places. Now, let's go to Isaiah 56. Oh, and then the story of Ruth, Ruth. Ruth, Ruth, she obeyed the same laws. What did she say? Your God is my God and your people are my people. If you look at the story of Exodus, when all the Israelites came out, who comes out with the Israelites? Who believed in God and came out with the Israelites? Did you know a great mixed multitude came out and God didn't say they couldn't come with the Israelites? God didn't say, you Gentiles stay back there in Egypt. God said, you're going to be my people? Let's go to the mountain, right with my people. You have the same law, just like we saw in Exodus 12, Leviticus 19, Numbers 15. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 56. Yeah, and Ruth became like in the lineage of Messiah, in the lineage of David, okay? Um, okay, Isaiah 56. Okay. Verse three, well, I'm gonna start at verse one. Keep justice and do righteousness for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is, let's talk about salvation. Who's our salvation? Yeshua, his name means Yeshua, salvation of Yah. Hmm, okay, so get that. Keep justice and do righteousness for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Huh. If you look through the whole Tanakh, which is Genesis to Malachi, do you, under, do you know that the most repeated commandment is to remember the Sabbath? It is extremely important. In fact, it has a death 
penalty attached to it. It is not one of the least commandments, right? Jesus' own word says, Yeshua says, Matthew 5, he who breaks the least of the commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches others to will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So one of the laws that gets the death penalty is breaking the Sabbath alongside murder. That is how important this Sabbath is to God. Do you think when we are warned that the Antichrist in Daniel 7, 25 will change God's times and ways, do you think we should probably think twice about following a person who fits the description of one who's against God when God says he's not going to change? God says, I'm not going to change. 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 So he said the Sabbath a billion times. It's my Sabbath. He says, my Sabbath, my Sabbath, my Sabbath, not the Gentile Sabbath, not the Jewish Sabbath, not the Israelite Sabbath, my Sabbath, my Sabbath, my Sabbath. Am I getting my point across? I think I'm going to go with the big guy and I'm just going to obey him. <laughs> I'm not going to take a chance that the one who changed the Sabbath is actually what the Bible says, the bad one, <laughs> right? Okay, so keep from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. That's the blessed one. Woo, you are blessed. You are blessed if you obey that Sabbath. Do not let the son of the foreigner. Are you a Gentile? Probably not. Most of you listening are probably blood Israelites, even if you're scattered. Um, I don't care what color, nationality, skin, whatever, because God's children, the seed of Zerah, the Zerah of Abraham went to all nations. There's a reason probably you believe in God. But let's say you are Caleb. Let's say you are Ruth and you just fear God. Praise God. You're grafted in. What do we read? You're treated as a native born. That's all through the Torah. All through the Torah. Okay. So do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuchs say, here I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. That's the Torah, the 613 laws. Even to them, I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Praise God. Where's my hallelujahs? <laughs> Where's those hallelujahs? Praise Yahweh. What do we see in 1 Corinthians 7, 19? Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters, but just obeying the commandments of God is what matters. Do we get what the New Testament is saying? Obey the law, but you don't obey the law to be saved. You can make a checklist of all the laws, not realize you're a sinner, think you're good enough because you obeyed that checklist and go straight to hell because you didn't understand that you were fallen. You didn't understand your need for God. You didn't humble yourself before the great and mighty God. Okay, okay. so also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. The Sabbath has a whole separate section. Holds my Sabbath and keeps my covenant. That Sabbath is extremely important to God. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Do you notice how a lot of churches say they're a house of prayer because they know it's an end time prophecy, but they forget the part about keeping the Sabbath? <laughs> right? Adonai Yahweh, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yes, I will, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Please turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. Last three verses. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 21. This is the millennial reign after Jesus Yeshua returns the second time. This is when our Messiah has gone through the tribulation. We've gone through the tribulation. We have endured, and he comes back and reigns, and this is what happens. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. Because remember, we go back to Israel. It's a renewal. It's a restoration, a restoration. It shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the Gentiles who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They, the Gentiles, shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with among and they shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be in that whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says Adonai Yahweh. If you look in Revelation at the New Jerusalem, there's no Gentile gate going into heaven. If you believe in God, Paul makes it extremely clear in the book of Romans, you are grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. 
There is no such thing anymore. When you accept God as your Savior and you accept Jesus as your Savior and you come to him, there is no such thing as you stay in a Gentile. We just read five verses, five sections that say there was one law from the very beginning of Exodus. One law for the Gentile and the native born. One law, not two different laws. Did you know that Noah on the ark, go read the story of Genesis because your Bible story lied to you, the pastor lied to you. It didn't say take two of every animal into the ark. It said take two of every unclean and seven of every clean animal. Do you know that every single man who followed God would have heard his voice? If you were walking with him, he would have directed their steps and Noah was directed by God to take seven clean animals and two unclean because he was going to be eating the clean animals. You had to have a bigger population from which to multiply on for the food source of the humans. He made a distinction in Genesis of the difference between clean and unclean right there from the beginning because the unclean weren't going to be eat, eaten. So you only had to have two of those because they could just multiply. You weren't going to be eating them or taking them out. How many people miss that? <laughs> okay. Hebrews chapter four. Are there any questions? Let me see if there's any questions. Let me pause for one second. Hi, Trish. Pause for one second. My husband has his DNA. That's awesome. You know what, Marie? You are an Israelite even if you didn't have a blood drop. If you believe in Jesus, Yeshua, and you cling to God, your blood. But yes, he's an Israelite. If he comes from the tribe of Judah, so, okay, so Jews are the southern kingdom, Benjamin, Levi, and Judah. My family happens to be from the tribe of Levi. We had the last name Kohen. K-O-H-E-N was our last name before we came to America. Okay, so that are, those are Levites. That's the word in Hebrew. Kohen is priest. There's C-O-H-E-N or K-O-H-E-N. Many believe that the sons of Aaron had the K-O-H-E-N and the other Israelites had the C-O-H-E-N, but they don't really have a definitive understanding of that. They're just not sure. When they came to America, they had to get their new names processed through English, and so there it was. Um, the Jews were ruled by the house of Judah under the um, tribe of David. David, um, his house ruled over the tribe of Judah after the separation of Israel and Judah under Solomon's son Rehoboam. That was a big series there. I hope you can follow that. Um, the northern tribes of Israel became known as Ephraim, Joseph, or Israel because they were ruled at first by a man from the tribe of Ephraim named um, Jeroboam. And so the 10 northern tribes got scattered, went through Europe, and, and, and they're being called back now. And the southern kingdom of Jews were told they could keep their identity. The northern tribes lost their identity and became the Gentiles. They mixed in with the Gentiles. And actually, let's pause for a minute and let's go to Hosea before we go to. Let's go to Hosea chapter 9, please. I didn't prepare any of this, guys. I didn't write down one thing. This is all Yahweh. He's just, boom, popping it in. Isn't that great? I love it when he just teaches us because... I didn't have time to prepare today. I have to be honest. I was like barely able. I didn't even know if I'd make the live tonight. Praise Javi, I did. And I even got a cheese tortilla shoved down. I don't even like to eat cheese a lot, but I had, <laughs> I had to get something in me and I got my new me tea. Hosea 9. This is a judgment about the 10 northern tribes of Israel. This was a curse put upon them because they had disobeyed God over and over and over and over. So please listen to that. We did a whole night Bible study live just reading through the book of Hosea one night. We read the whole thing. And the 10 northern tribes were scattered to through. Typically, they went up through Europe. And you can prove it in history. Some people try to say they went to Africa. No, some Jews went to Africa. But no, the 10 northern tribes of Israel went through Europe and America. You can study it out. The Behestin Rock, all sorts of historical records. The Scythians, just different things. The, the Irish language itself has 730 exact Hebrew words. Okay, so in this prophecy from Hosea to Israel, he says, look, you're going to be cast off to the nations, become the Gentiles, like Genesis chapter 48, verse 19 says, you're going to become the fullness of the Gentiles, but then God's going to bring you back. He's going to scatter you, but bring you back. Here's one of the curses that was going to happen to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. The same people who say they're freed from the law today, because many of these 10 northern tribes of Israel went to the Christian nations, and those Christian, they, we were, it was prophesied that um, Ephraim would physically become the Gentiles, at Genesis 48, verse 19, in the Hebrew it says that. And guess what? They're the ones who say they're freed from the law, and they believe in Jesus, they believe in God. They are the scattered tribes of, of Israel, most of them. Let's listen, though, if it was a freedom to break the law. 
Let's see. Okay, so do not, I'm going to start in verse one. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and the winepress shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in Yahweh's land. Okay, they're going to get kicked out of Israel. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. This is a judgment. It's not freedom to eat pork, especially because Jesus didn't set you up for failure. When we see that he returns the second time, Isaiah 65 and 66, go read it. I think it's um, 65 verse five, 17 and 66 verse 5 or the other way around. But it's, he literally says those eating swine's flesh will be consumed when he comes and their smoke in his nostrils hot air than thou. Okay, so they shall not dwell in Yahweh's land. They're going to be kicked out for their disobedience. Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat un clean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to Yahweh, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing. They're going to lose the sacrifices. They didn't get to do it. It's a bad thing they lost this, right? It shall be like bread of mourners to them. Blah, 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 blah. And it goes on to say, what are you going to do to the feast days? What are you going to do? Because it's taken away from you. A curse that was put upon the children of Israel for their disobedience was that they were going to return to the nations and eat unclean things. If you read the curses in, um, in Deuteronomy, one of the curses is you're going to serve false gods. Oh, like Christmas, Saturnalia, and Easter, the name of a Babylonian goddess. That was a curse. It was the curse for the, is the blindness for um, the punishment of, diso of di disobedience. It was not freedom, freedom, comes from the law of liberty because freedom is from sin. If I hope your pastor can hear this girl. I hope you just get this right through his head because you are freed from sin, not freed to continue in sin. You didn't need Jesus if you could just continue in sin. Jesus isn't a magic pill that you can say, hey, Jesus, forgive me. Now I'm going to go keep sinning. That's not what Jesus came to do. Yeshua came to pay the price for your sin, which is transgression of the law. Therefore, you are told to go and sin no more. And if you know sin is transgression of the law, why would you eat pig on purpose? That is laying it at Jesus' feet and trampling his blood. That is saying like, you know what? Flipping in the birdie and saying, you know what, Yeshua? I know you died to forgive me for sin, but now I'm gonna sin on purpose. Who does that? Who does that? But that is exactly what the modern church teaches. And that is what they say. They have removed the pathway to repentance. And if you didn't have to obey the law, if there was no law anymore pointing out your sins, then you don't need Yeshua because there's no sin. We are told in the book of Rome, if there is no law, there is no sin. So, so okay, so then why do you need Yeshua anymore? Nobody needs to accept Jesus as their savior. If, they, oh, if there's no law to point out any penalty you did, you're fine anyway. But do you see the flawed logic? If we understand we are sinners and transgressors, which every single one of us, the reason we cling, clung to Yahweh and accepted him as our Lord and Savior is because we said, oh my gosh, I've been bad. And do you know there's not one law in the New Testament that's not in the Old Testament? <laughs> it, there's explanations of it, like, hey, what it means to not commit um, adultery is like not even to lust. But there's not one law that's different in the New Testament. They, they don't make up new laws. They're all talking about and validating the Torah. So, if you didn't have a law anymore, if the law was nailed to the cross, then we wouldn't have a need for a Messiah. But you know what was nailed to the cross? The penalty for when we broke the law. Now go read that again. Go read it. Go read it. It doesn't say. It says the enmity that was in the law was done away. Well, what was the enmity? Because there's a bunch of, cur there's a bunch of blessings in the law. And that's not enmity against us. The enmity is like, hey, hey, Melissa, you were drunk. You were a drunkard. Hey, Melissa, you were promiscuous. You were, I dressed like a slut. You know, you were sexually immoral in the way you dressed. And Melissa, that law stands against you. That dishonored God. Bam. You can't go to heaven. You can't see God. You're just a sinner. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a sinner. I can't see God. But praise God for his son, Yeshua, who paid the price for my sin so that when I repent and I say sorry for my sin, that blood covered that. That's what the sacrifices were to teach us about, the sin offerings and the burnt offering. Now we have all sorts of offerings just of Thanksgiving, which were just like barbecue dinners with daddy, right? 
And we're gonna have that again, Ezekiel 45 shows it clearly, but is everybody tracking thus far? Are you following thus far or do we have any questions? Okay, I think, think D, hold me accountable, but I think I can pause right here to see if we have any legitimate related questions. If it's not related, I'm not gonna answer it. You're gonna have to ask it again at the end. Okay. Um, Ezekiel chapter 47 verses, okay, I'm sorry. I read Ezekiel 47, the last few verses, Nellie, where it was talking about that they get a portion of land and whatever they choose to sojourn. Clean and unclean is defined in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 for the animals, for the um, what we can eat and what not. Did you get my message about the best Sabbath documentary ever made? Uh, I don't think I did, or did I not see it? I'm sorry, I don't think I did see it. I had, I have a lot of messages and sometimes I forget because I get distracted because somebody, will, I'll have to go do the cows or something. Is the clean animals, is the clean, unclean the animals are already mated? No, no, no. So unclean are the things we do not eat. That's what I'm talking about. So we don't eat like rabbits. We don't eat pig. We don't eat things like that. We don't eat humans, like the flesh that we don't eat. And so the clean are the things like a beef, sheep, deer, stuff like that. But he just said 4% juice. That's awesome. And then 4%. Who cares? Once you're once you're converted to God, you're hundred percent Israelite. <clears throat> okay, why is there a thousand years and then Satan is loose for a short time? Because that's a good question, D. That is appropriate as we get to we're studying about the pre trib rapture stuff. Um that there is no pre trib rapture. Um Satan is bound up for a thousand years. That's the seventh day. Okay, so this is now this links to the the whole thing that you're gonna be talking about the pastor with the pastor, Audrey, because the Sabbath, mm. Mm. D, hold that thought. I'm going to write it down because this goes with this. We're going to do Colossians 2 in a minute because that's going to, that talks all together here, it ties all together. Let me write it down so I don't forget. So 1,000 years, locked up. I want to get back to this, but I'm going to keep that one's a little bit in a minute here. So Colossians 2 goes together. Um, and then seventh day, Sabbath, seventh period of 1,000 years. Okay, so hang with us, D. We're going to get to that one. Leviticus 11, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay. Love it. Okay. So does a rabbi have to bless all meat? Nope. That is rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism was started after the Babylonian exile. They started to codify extra laws because they got afraid because it got scattered. So they made extra laws, defense in the laws, and they called that the Talmud. The Jewish rabbi does not need to bless anything you eat, but you must make sure it's clean in God's eyes. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. Um, we don't eat rabbits. No, we don't eat rabbits. So go read that. That's in Leviticus 11 um, and Deuteronomy 14. Oh, uh, my bad. I thought it was a whole new thing. I haven't heard yet. It's one of those days. When, that's okay, sweetie. Don't even worry. Okay. Now, please go to Hebrews chapter 4. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 says this. This is Hebrews, right? Now, we already, if you go back and look through the study we did on Romans, Romans already said obey the law. <laughs> Once you're saved, obey the law. First Corinthians already said, obey the law. Like it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, obey the law, obey the commandments of God. That's first Corinthians seven nineteen. It doesn't matter. Just obey the commandments of God. Right. And one of those commandments would be physically circumcised. Okay. So here we are. Hebrews chapter four. Okay. You know, I do recall the father told us not to use the metaphor. You know, I do recall the father told us not to eat something before and we still don't listen. Yeah. Does clean have to do with how an animal is killed? No, no. That's again rabbinic Judaism. So the clean animals are listed in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. The clean, the things that are food for us. Think about it this way. You buy special food for your dog, that's dog food. You buy cat food for your cat. My cows get hay and grass, right? Sometimes I can give them some grain, but I gotta be careful with certain grains because they're hot. They're too hot, they'll, they'll bloat them. Goats have a specific diet. Chickens have a specific diet. Humans have a specific diet. Every single creature that God made has a specific diet. God outlined ours for us so that we would know how not to hurt our bodies and not defile the temple of the living God. Hebrews chapter four. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. 
the Sabbath, the seventh day, in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards have spoken of other days, of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open in his eyes to him who, who to him whom we must give account. Okay, I'm just going to stop right there. But you see there, like, it's like it's saying, like, look, they disobeyed by not keep entering his rest on the seventh day. Therefore, there remains a seventh day. Let's keep the seventh day. Um, let's go to, uh, let's go to Revelation 18. Actually, wait a minute. Yeah, we'll go here. So all through Isaiah, there's a few different verses. I think there's twice where it says to come out of Babylon lest you be destroyed in her midst. Um, could somebody, since I don't have my iPad down here because I forgot, could somebody please Google where the verses are that say come out of Babylon lest you be destroyed in her midst because I don't want to lose you guys on the phone and if I try to, you won't see me and if I swipe over and go to the Bible app, we won't see it. So there are, there are a few we do not eat animals that are strangled or die from sickness. That is in the Torah. So that's clear we don't. So would somebody please go find those verses for us that are in Isaiah and even the one that's in Revelation. And what we're going to talk about here, I want to read um, chapter 18 of Revelation. So I guess, Nellie, we're a little bit in Revelation. Okay. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the only way she... Yeah, okay, I mean... The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. I found the verse, that one. There's, there's two in Isaiah, and I can't remember where it's at. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. Do you know that nobody lives in Babylon, Iraq, right? Raise your hand if you know that nobody lives in Babylon, Iraq. Like that's, That was destroyed years ago. This is the end time. This is a revelation for the end days. Come out of her, Babylon, my people, lest you be destroyed, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Okay, <laughs> this should make you think, like, come out of her, my people. God's people are in Babylon. Nobody lives in Babylon, Iraq. Oh, this has to be spiritual. What does the word Babylon mean? Confusion. Okay. The Tower of Babel, Babel, in Chaldea where it was built, Tower of Babel, confusion of language, confusion. It was spoken, um, they, the, the languages were confused back then. Then Babylon has continued out through history to indicate and mean and always represent confusion. Hmm. So if we take a little bit of Satan, mix it with a little bit of God, we have an elixir of confusion. And that's exactly what the Catholic faith did. So the Catholic Church the word Catholic means universal. They were the very first ones to institute a one world religious system. Catholic, they wanted to be universal, encompassing every single religious faith. Hmm, you can probably see that, can't you? So the Catholics want to be universal. They're universal. They'll, they'll sit with Muslims. They'll They'll say they serve the same God. They will say that it's okay. Mormons, they are okay. They say everything's okay except for if you're Jewish, just so you know. Is it a sin to know multiple languages? Absolutely not, Jenna. It's, it's, 
sports. Okay, what? It's hard to follow the Sabbath, holy when you're unequally yoked. Um, so interest in this is where you're going to be called to stand up. You have to choose God over convenience. You have to choose God over man's ways. So I put my foot down with sports when my son was little and that's a whole other story. We're going to get there. But, but it is a choice. You choose to obey or not. You choose to, because it didn't say it's going to be easy to follow God. It says you're going to have to look different from the world, come away from the world. It's okay to let your kids be angry at you. It's okay to make other people angry. Now, if it, you are the mom. You are the parent. Now, if you're unequally yoked and your husband is not with you, then he's going to bear the consequence of that and then let it be on him. But I never, ever condoned or went along with anything my husband did when he was not obeying Torah. I let that be his choice. I didn't go to the events he went to on Sabbath. I did not break the Sabbath. And God blessed me. And there's some consequences on the other side that I won't necessarily always divulge. But you choose you. I'm going to stand before God alone. You're going to stand before God. You can't say, well, my husband made me. Just like Adam can't say, well, Eve made me. Adam still got cursed. We're still going to get... We would still get punished. And so here's the thing you've got to do is you've got to remember you're the light right now. Yeshua didn't compromise and he never condoned or consoled sin. He stood so solid in love, but he didn't compromise. And that's how they knew to come to, they could come to the rock. Because if you're a stinking ship and you're compromising, like your, water, your boat's filled with water, like you're not really going to save them. But if you're so rigid and solid in God's truth and obedience to him and in, in love and grace then you're not going to sink and they actually can pull out. So your your obedience is what pulls them out of the wrongness because it convicts them. And that's what Jesus, Yeshua did. He never once condoned the sins. He didn't ever go along with their sin. He didn't do bad things with them. He didn't, he always did what was right. And so that's what we got to remember. So when God says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities, render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, listen, I sit as a queen and am no widow. Wait a minute, what does widow infer? What does the word widow infer? that she has had a husband. And this Babylonian, this entity that is Babylon, says, I'm not a widow, I'm married. My husband is alive. Who claims to have God as their husband? But they're a harlot because they're doing harlotrous things with pagan gods. Oh, right, the Catholic and Protestant churches. Okay, let's keep going. And will not see so. I'm, I sit as a queen and, and, and I'm not a widow. Because she believes, the church believes, oh, we are God's chosen. We're going to be raptured out of here. We're God's chosen people. They are widowed because they, they don't understand that like, they're not even following God, right? That's the whole thing. We're coming out of that system. And she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is Adonai Yahweh who judges her. The kings of the earth who commit fornication and live luxuriously with her will weep and lament when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that great city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Now, if we had backed up, we could remember where this city, this Babylon, this harlot, is the city on seven hills. Oh, interesting. That's the Vatican again. Always links back to the Catholic Church. Um, I do want to find the verse... Um, I, I didn't prepare at all. Sorry. Um, but I do want to find the verse here to go chapter 19. Here it is. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, all hallelujah. It's hallelujah, not hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahweh our Elohim for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot. If you're a harlot, you were cheating on something, like you were being promiscuous. Who corrupted the earth with her fornication. Huh, so how can an entity commit fornication? Oh, right, with demon gods. All through the book of Ezekiel, all through the Old Testament, the Tanakh, you see spiritual adultery referred to. It's spiritual adultery. They commit harlotry against God by not following his ways. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants, shed by her. Um, where is the verse that says the daughters? Um, I want to find that. And I'm so sorry. I should have looked at this before, but I didn't. And so now I don't have my thing down here to look at the, where that is. 
Could somebody find the verse? Is it is it back here in 17? I think it, maybe it is. Yep, here we go. Let's go back to chapter 17. Here it is. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls come, came and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And if you've ever been carried away in the spirit, it you go there, but you're still where you are. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast with which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Fornication again. Guys, this is person is committing sexual, um, spiritual perversion against God. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Hmm. Keep that in mind, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to produce them. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of earth, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay. There are also seven kings. I'm just going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. The mother of harlots. There's a mother. So there's a mother and daughters. Okay. We had the con. We had the contrasting mother and woman in Revelation chapter 12. We had the woman of Israel, the is, true Israelites, the born again people, it says they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus. That's Revelation 12, go read it. Those are the true believers. They're not called harlots. They're not called fornicators. 1260 days, the woman, that woman is hidden in the wilderness. This woman, we are told, is going to be burned. This Babylon is going to be burned and judged. Two different stories going on here. So here you have the mother and the woman of Israel, who are the believers who have to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. These are the ones Revelation 12 talks about. They're hidden in the wilderness and they get washed white. They have come out of the pagan system. They have come out of the Babylonian Christian system and they are worshiping God. They're going through the tribulation. There's no preacher rapture. They're going right through it. It shows that in Revelation chapter 12. Then you have this mother over here, the mother of harlots. Notice how Satan always has a counterfeit, right? There's always, if God does it, Satan tries to recreate it or copy it in a different twist, perversing, perverting it. Now, I want you to go and look up a document called um, Protestant. Uh, Catholic and Protestant confessions about this um, seventh day Sabbath or about the Sunday Sabbath. That's it. Catholic and Protestant confessions about the Sunday Sabbath. In that book, they have a direct quote from the Catholic annals, which says that, and I, I'm going to paraphrase this, but they say, we, the Holy Mother Church, the Catholic Church, find the Protestants unthinking, claiming to be sola scriptura. They said that they're definitely not sola scriptura. They don't only follow the Bible. Because we, the Holy Mother Church, instituted the Sunday Sabbath, and we are the ones who instituted the holidays of Christmas and Easter. And the Protestants follow our holidays, for which there is no biblical mandate. And they follow our Sabbath, for which there is no biblical mandate. We believe that the way, the, the re, we believe that the fact that we could change the Sabbath to Sunday proves that we are God's power on earth. Wow. Blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Because God said he didn't change. God said from the beginning what day he sanctified. You cannot pretend Sunday is an okay day now to go and call the Sabbath. Because there was already a yearly holiday. It's, it doesn't matter that Yeshua rose on the first day of the week, which he did. He rose sometimes Saturday night to Sunday morning before the sunrise. Right, That's the first day of the week in the biblical calendar. Okay, There was already a holiday for that. A yearly holiday. A yearly Moedim appointed feast time called your um, feast of first fruits. So we didn't need to change God's ways. He already took into account that once a year we're going to remember the resurrection of Messiah. Now, 
when we know that the Catholic Church calls the Protestants her daughters, and here we see a mother of harlot daughters, and we are told the spiritual adultery all through Scripture is when we do not follow God's ways. Do we really think, let's think logically, is it, would following God's commandments, is that harlotry against God when he took us all the way out of Egypt and brought us to the mountain to give us his commandments and said, if you follow these, you'll be my people? So if we don't, if we follow his commandments, do you think he's going to change his mind and say, well, now you're committing harlotry because you are obeying me. How dare you obey me? Oh my goodness, don't obey me. Does that make sense? That doesn't even make sense, does it? God did not save us from Egypt, give us the commandments and then say, I'm going to judge you if you obey me. Oh boy, you're going right to hell if you obey me. You're a Judaizer if you obey me. Oh my goodness, you're bad if you obey me. Uh, you know what? In fact, I'm going to take those laws out of the way. And if you try to obey those laws, man, not only am I going to, you're a harlot then. That's, that's not what God says. That's, that doesn't even make sense, but that's what the church teaches. That's what the church teaches. That's wrong. But now you know why the church teaches that. Because she is a daughter of the harlot. And that is where the church is is very much in the book of Revelation. Now, how do we know this one step further? Let's go a little bit step further. So we have the Babylon. We were told to come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of Babylon, my people. So that's God's people. Come out of Babylon unless you be, you're going to receive her judgments. Okay. And God says he's going to judge Babylon. If you look at the Babylonian mythology of the Mesopotamia region, you will find that they worshiped on Sunday because they were all sun worshipers. It's the day of the sun god, sun day, day of the sun god, right, through the Romans. But the Romans adopted, okay, let's go through this. So Babylon, Babylonian Empire reigned over that Mesopotamian region at some point, and for the, it was Babylon, Medea, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Rome came over from like the Italian area, came over through Europe, and it conquered that region and it adopted the Babylonian traditions that were already there. So there's this Babylonian God that was like, now you're gonna have to study these all out separately. So there's Mithra from Egypt, there's Tammuz, there's a, a, um, Semiramis, all of these gods, Nimrod. Nimrod is in the Bible, talked about. They started worshiping Nimrod as a man who was born of a virgin woman <laughs> they started, Satan made up the counterfeit story. And so the whole Mesopotamia region had this story going around. And the thing with theirs, though, is they got to eat pig. They ate pig because their god, Tammuz, who was related to the whole story of Semiramis and Nimrod, Tammuz was bored to death by a pig and therefore, and came back, and so therefore they eat a pig. That's why you eat pig. That's why we don't, we don't. That's why the unbelievers or the wayward believers or Babylonian believers, I don't even know what word is used there. That's why they roast a pig on Easter. <laughs> There's an Easter ham because it goes all the way back to that. Did you know Ezekiel 8 and 9 address this? And they say not to do the weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was the god that was linked to the festival of Easter, Ashtoreth. You remember the Bible says have nothing to do with the Ashtoreths or Ashtoreths? That is the word in through translitteration of the and a meta, you know, morphology of the language, Easter is that same word, Asherah, Ashtoreth. It's Easter now in English, okay? Sunday was the Babylonian day of worship. Easter was the name of a Babylonian goddess who came to the river Euphrates, supposedly, and produced an egg laying bunny to show that she was a deity. Christmas was the feast of Saturnalia in that region, who not only celebrated Nimrod, but also, or, I mean, Tammuz, but also celebrated Mithra and Samarimus, those all these things go together, and it always was at the winter solstice. So we know Jesus wasn't born in the winter. We know that. Many people believe he was in the spring born, and some people believe he was in the fall born. Uh, he was born in the fall. I don't know why I said that backwards language there, but either way, he wasn't, couldn't have been born in the winter, right? And so we just know that. So then we start thinking, why, why, why does the Catholic priest wear this little hat that looks, if you turn it from the side, it has a fish mouth. It's a fish mouth. Have you ever noticed that? The bishop or whoever those Catholic people are, they wear this hat that has, it's the fish. Did you know that was a Babylonian god named Dagon? And in fact, the book of Samuel talks about, no, the book of Judges talks about it. Okay. Huh. Interesting. So we're told, God's people are told to come out of Babylon. 
And we know that God wouldn't say his own commandments are bad, <laughs> right? He's not going to call his commandments Babylon. He's not going to call obeying his commandments harlotry. He's not going to call his commandments adultery when specifically the ketubah, the marriage ceremony was, hey, I saved you. Now, if you want to be my people, here's my commandments. He's not going to change and trick you. He didn't trick you. Ooh, I tricked you. I got you to obey those commandments. And now I can judge you as a harlot. What? What? <laughs> no. And we just read, we just read that the judgment to the 10 northern tribes was they were going to return to the Gentile nations and eat unclean things as part of the curse against them and serve false gods. Okay, so then the system that comes from the region to which the 10 northern tribes were scattered, this system that is over in the European area where the 10 northern tribes were scattered, huh, all of a sudden, it's called the harlot. Look at the shape of Italy. Look at the shape. It is shaped like a hooker's boot. Do you know from aerial views you can see God's name, yod heh vav -Hey, inscribed around the mountains of Jerusalem? And do you know, looking from aerial views, you can see the hooker. You can see where the harlot is. God didn't even play games with us. He didn't even hide it from us. He's like, I'm going to show you where that harlot comes from. And I'm going to tell you, it's a city on seven hills. Oh, right. Rome and the Vatican both surrounded by seven hills. The city on seven hills. Huh. This isn't coincidence. It's not coincidence that the modern Catholic faith, the modern Protestant faith, is based on modern mythological holidays. We are told in the book of Galatians, I'm sorry, my nose is sort of itching here. We're told in the book of Galatians chapter four. Let's read it. I'm not even looking at questions, so I stay on track because otherwise sometimes these studies get too hard for people to follow. I'm staying very focused. We will go through the questions at the end, okay? Um, let's go to Galatians chapter four, verse eight. But then indeed... When you did not know God. So you're over here. These are Gentiles in Galatia. They did not have the law. These were not the Jews or the Israelites who had the law. These are people who did not know the law. So over here, without the law, they didn't know God. Okay? You served those things which by nature are not gods. They served idols like Easter, Ishtar, Samarimus, Tammuz, um, you get what I'm saying, right? All of the Saturnalia, soul, soul is the sun God. You served these things when you didn't know God. You, you didn't have the law. You were Gentiles. You didn't know anything about the law. You're over here serving these things and not God. But now, okay, so that's, you, you served those things which by nature are not God when you didn't know God. But now after you've known God, so let's jump over my head. Boink, we know God now, or rather are known by God. How is it that you turn again you're going back over here. You're going back again to the weak and beggarly elements in which you desire again to be in bondage. The law is not what they're referencing here because they weren't following the law. They were not following God's holidays. They were following pagan holidays for pagan idols and false demons. This is not talking about God's laws they're returning to because they didn't have it. You can't return to something you didn't have because when you know God, it says you're going to obey him. That's what the Bible says. So if you don't know God, you're over here stuck in bondage, not knowing him, worshiping false demons. So how is it you're returning to this? You observe days, months, and seasons, and years. Oh, Christmas season. Oh, um, Easter and uh, Valentine's Day and birthday parties. And oh, let's keep going. You're observing days and seasons and all these things that were not of God. Do you really think, okay, so first of all, we, we already established they could not have been doing the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Passover, because they didn't even know. They were over here doing the false things. They didn't know God. They never read the Bible. They didn't have the Torah, right? <laughs> they didn't have the Torah. So they're over here serving demon gods. Then they know God, so they start probably doing Passover and, and Feast of First Fruits, and, but then they turn back to the old ways which were not of God. People t twist that out of context, don't they? It doesn't, it couldn't possibly mean returning to the laws of God. It, that's impossible. That's physically 100% impossible because they didn't know God's laws. He literally says, you didn't know God. Now why are you returning to those things? And that is exactly what the Christian church is doing. 
Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10. I hope, Audrey, this is getting you some fuel for... <laughs> it's a long, encompassing sto story of who is this harlot? Who's Babylon? What do you mean come out of Babylon? It's because you have to... I had to start at the beginning talking about the, you know, the obedience, the law, what happened to the 10 Northern tribes, because it's a story that goes together that if you don't see the story in the Bible, that's how you can parse scripture apart. But if you know the whole story of a continuation of restoration, the dispersion and the calling back, then you can see what's happening. You can understand what Paul's talking about. You can understand what John is talking about in the book of Revelation. Where did I tell us to go, guys? Oh my gosh, I just forgot where I was going. We were going here. We went to Galatians. Oh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says Yahweh, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them, for the customs of their people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. God said, do not learn the ways of the Gentiles. Now let's go over Deuteronomy chapter 12. Verse 29. When Yahweh your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. You shall not worship your God, Yahweh your God in that way for every abomination to Yahweh which he hates they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Hmm. Do you know on a Christmas tree when you go put presents under the tree, you're bowing to the false god. You're bowing to that god and the balls on the tree are prayers to the false gods and birthday candles are prayers to false gods to protect you on your day. Huh. Confusion. God is holy. God doesn't mix a little bit of sin in with a lot of righteousness. God is 100% righteous and he tells you to be holy. The word holy in Hebrew is kadosh kadesh. Whichever, you can, there's different pronunciations depending on if it's used an adjective, a noun, verb, whatever. So kadosh is holy. Set apart and it means different from. So God said from the beginning which day he chose the Sabbath. We're told in Daniel 7.25. Let's read it. Here's another one. <laughs> I gotta find it. Because I went the wrong way because I'm tired. I told you, today has been very intense. As far as, not a bad, not a bad intense. I'm just tired. Daniel 7. Okay, this is talking about, okay, I'm going to back up to verse 23. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. Trample it and break it in pieces. Remember we read that it has 10 toes, partly of iron, partly of clay. What? Oh, 10 northern tribes. Oh! <gasps> Ten northern tribes went through Europe. Oh, the Christians, the tear in the wheat, the modern nation, the modern Christian nations where the ten northern tribes were prophesied to go to eat unclean things because of their judgment. And then God is going to pull his children out from among them. The iron from the clay it says they mixed in with the seed, but it shall not stay. He shall pull out that. And that is the, that's the day in which Yeshua comes. The stone cut without any hands comes and sets up his kingdom. You guys, this all goes together. Okay. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the ones and he shall do three kings. So there's going to be a league of ten. We've talked about that. We we read this. This is, gosh, we've been doing so many of these studies, so it's good. Um, I can't remember which night we did it, though. We went through this and we went through the ten, ten toes of Daniel. And we went through like how the partly of iron, partly of clay. We are told in Jeremiah, we are the clay. But God set, right now is separating his people from those who are not his people. The tear and the wheat are separating. You better separate. You better come out of Babylon or you're going to receive of her plagues. Get out of the church system now before it is too late. And I am not even exaggerating. We read it. We're reading it. Here's the thing. 
this last, this fourth beast is going to speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. We are going to be persecuted. There's no pre-trib rapture. And shall intend to change times and law. This is the bad person and who boasts that they changed God's time of the Sabbath and that they changed God's holidays. The Catholic Church who is just by chance happens to fit every prophecy in Revelation because it's the city on seven hills. Oh, and then if we go to Daniel chapter 9, we're told the people of the prince to come, the Antichrist prince, every every historian, every, every footnote will tell you this, the Antichrist, Antichrist, every single one says the people of the prince to come will destroy the temple. Who destroyed the temple? The Romans in 70 AD. Does the Antichrist, is he a Roman Catholic priest? Oh, no. I think the Roman Catholic priest is the false prophet. The Antichrist is going to be a Christian from the tribe of Dan. He, Genesis chapter 49 says that Dan will judge his people. He will be a serpent by the way. He, that is in the days of the salvation of the children of Israel. We are told that Dan is not sealed. Revelation chapter 7, we are told that Dan is not sealed before the tribulation. The Christians are the number 10, right? The 10 northern tribes went through Europe, and that's the Christian nations. We have both houses, two houses. There's Israel and there's Judah. It says both houses stumble over the Messiah. You all can name how the Jews, how my families, his, how did the Jews stumble over the Messiah? They did not understand that Jesus was the blood Messiah. And how does the other house stumble over the Messiah? Most Christians look at me like, I don't know, there's a second house. What do you mean? The house of Israel was scattered to the nations, prophesied to become the Gentiles in Genesis chapter 40, 48, verse, sorry, 40, yeah, 48, verse 19. And it says in Hosea, they would go to the Gentile, they become to the Gentiles, they would eat unclean things, be not God's people, but come back in the days of the Messiah. Ezekiel chapter 37 says the dead bones, 30, 36 and 37 says the dead bones of Israel will come back to life. They were dead, cast off, but they're coming back. Those are the Christian nations and they stumble because they do not understand the prophecies in Isaiah in Deuteronomy that say that when the Messiah comes, he will teach the law. You can't have a Messiah that didn't teach the law. The Messiah of God teaches the laws of God. The Messiah does not lead you down to the path of the Antichrist. We are told in Corinthians, we are told all through scripture that the Antichrist is the man of lawlessness, not lawfulness. That Matthew chapter 7 says, many will come to me in that day. This is Jesus talking. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many wonders in your name? And he said, get away from me. I never knew you, you who don't obey the law. It literally says there, you who are against the law, you who do not have the law. He won't know you. Do you know a wayward, disobedient child? No. These people believed in Jesus. Um, sorry, John chapter 2 says many believed in Jesus that day. The last few verses, go read it. Many believed in Jesus, but he did not commit himself to them for he knew what was in their hearts. He says, Jesus says, many are called, few are chosen. Difficult is the path and few who are who find it. It says a remnant will be left. So when you see the masses and every single Tom, Dick, and Harry out there claims they're a Christian and they're being homosexual, smoking dope, doing marijuana, they're getting high, they're intoxicated, they're drunkards, we are warned in the book of Romans that those practicing those things are not the children of God and they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are the tare, the T-A-R-E. They are being separated from you, but you better come out because when that plague and that lightning strikes them, you don't want to be standing too close. And the Bible says in Isaiah, I haven't even looked down because I don't want to get distracted. I'm keeping everybody focused today. I got to keep me focused. In Isaiah, it says very specifically, come out of Babylon, lest you hear the rumor and fear. There's a rumor that's going to fear the people. The Gentiles are going to trample the temple. The people who care about the temple that have no reverence for God are the Christians. The Bible says Daniel judges people as one of the tribes of Israel. He is not labeled. He is not sealed. We know that's a Christian. We know that the, Brit the house of Britain is where the tribe of Dan was scattered. You can study it out historically. The British family, the British royal family claims to have the lineage of David. Blasphemously, they do not. They're not Jews. 
They claim to have the throne of David right in their house, right in their castle. They, they, they have a statue of Prince Charles that, that literally says Savior of the world. In Isaiah 23, it says Tyre, T-Y-R-E, who is linked with Dan and linked with Britain in prophetic pictures of the scriptures. It says they will be forgotten for 70 years, the days of one ruler, and then arise to commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world. Did you know Queen Elizabeth just died this year? And she's ruled exactly 70 years. She reigned exactly 70 years according to that prophecy. God told me 22 years ago to watch, watch the House of England that that was going to be them. That was them. And it happened 70 years. 70 years she reigned. And then they're going to commit heart, uh, fornication. Do you know that Prince Charles? Prince Charles is the one who put, who, he's the one who started the Great World Reset. He is the one. It was his idea. This is not coincidence. We will be here. Now let's, let's segue this into the Feast of God. We have the Feast of God. So we are told, let's go to Matthew 24. Let's just talk about the tribulation. We're going to go to Revelation 16 after this. So I got to write it down so I don't forget. Okay. Matthew 24, 15. Here's Yeshua talking to believers and do not say it's just Jews here because you can see in the book of Acts people from all around the world every feast came to Jerusalem so don't say it was just the Jews he's talking to people came to the temple from all over the world who were believers at all points Cornelius all the peoples the Gentile believers anybody who had a heart for God like that's in the gospels there were Gentiles who believed in him and they got this Holy Spirit too right well I'm sorry that one actually was in Acts not the gospels but you get what I'm saying Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when, when you, you, believers, he's talking to us, see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place. This is not Antiochus Epiphany's idol that was in the temple because that was before, that was like 400 and some years before this, or however many years. I think it was 430. That's not what he's talking about because that has already passed. This is future tense. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. We will have a third temple. Read Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end. The, uh, the whole tribulation, read Daniel, read Revelation. There's a temple that will be defiled. The temple is good. The Antichrist does not build the temple. The Antichrist defiles the temple, we're told. Okay. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who sits in the mountaintop not go down to take any of his things of his coat. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight, listen, pray that your flight may not be in a winter or on the Sabbath. They're obviously still keeping the Sabbath. We're still supposed to be keeping the Sabbath. Yeshua warns us the day is going to happen. The Sabbath, that word Sabbath, there's Sabbathon in Greek, Shabbat in Hebrew. There's only one day called that. <laughs> there's only one day. I mean, we don't have to guess. When the Sabbath is, we know in the Hebrews, Yom Shom, Yom Sheni, Yom Shelish, Yom Rivi, Yom Shabi, Shi, 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 Yom Shabbat. Like there's the days of the week are, that's what they're called. We know it's called Sabbath. We don't have to guess, hey, what day is the Sabbath? Oh, right. It's called Sabbath. Okay. <laughs> that was right in Genesis that it says that. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. Did God just show, did Jesus just show them they're going to be raptured out? Or did he say, flee and hide? Yeah, flee and hide. No, nor ever shall be, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise. So guys, we're going to be going through the tribulation. People are looking for a preacher of rapture. So a lot of false messiahs are going to deceive people quickly. We know, we are told in Zechariah 14, he returns at the Feast of Trumpets on the Mount of Olives after the tribulation, right? Because... We'll get there, how we know this. But in the seven festivals, Audrey, they are called appointments in Hebrew. The word for festival in Hebrew is moadim, and it means appointments. If I go to Israel today and I schedule an appointment like to get my hair washed or something, it's a moed, the moadim is plural. So the moadim of the Feast of Trumpets is the only holiday in the biblical calendar that you never know the hour of the year of, the, the day or the hour of. You never know the day or the hour of. Colossians 2 says, let no one judge you in regards to new moons, feasts, or Sabbaths because they are the shadow of things to come and the substances of Christ. That's not talking about pagan holidays. Pagan holidays aren't a shadow of things to come. They're substances in of Christ. But I tell you what, the seven holidays in Leviticus 23 sure are, right? So we had the Feast of Passover when he died, Feast of Firstfruits when he rose from the dead, Feast of um, 
unleavened bread when he gets the whole, um, the sin out of our hearts, the Feast of um, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, when we got the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost. And then we have Feast of Trumpets. Now we have the fall feast that he's going to come and fulfill yet. He has not yet done that. He hasn't met with his people on those appointments. Feast of Trumpets, we never know the day or the hour. Tonight, we were, so for the last three nights, they have had people in Israel looking for the new moon. Tonight, they spotted the new moon. So we knew somebody spotted it. They blew the shofar. Boom, it's the new month. Tonight begins the ninth month on the biblical calendar, for real. They waited until they saw it. Last night, people were thinking they might be able to see it, but nobody saw it with a visible eye. So it was not the ninth month. Today is the ninth month. Okay, that when Yeshua returns at the end of the tribulation, we will be watching and waiting for the sliver of the moon, the light that appears that Zechariah 14 talks about after the tribulation, after it, at the appointed time. And then 10 days later, we have the day of judgment where Yeshua judges the world. Five days later, we start the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when he will be, he will start reigning for the thousand years. We are very, if you understood the prophetic timeline of God's feast, you know he returns after the tribulation, not in the middle of it. He returns at the exact time at the end after the harvest. Like that's the harvest right, right then. Okay, so don't go and believe all these false messiahs because you're going to have people who believed in a preacher of rapture, they're going to get confused. Remember, that's what Babylon means. If you don't come out of Babylon, you're going to receive her for plagues. Isaiah says you're going to hear the rumors. You're going to be just, you're going to be confused. When you mix a little bit of poison in a dream, or a little bit of poison in a drink, that whole drink still becomes poison. When you mix a little bit of sin, a little bit of confusion, a little bit of pagan idolatry in with the Christian faith, it still becomes poison faith, right? God already said to Samuel, through, to, from Samuel to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. And we just read in Deuteronomy 12, Jeremiah 10, all the places where God said, do not worship me that way. Don't do the decree. I don't want the Christmas tree. Don't make it about me. Don't, don't take holidays for pagan gods and make them about me. He said not to. So obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't you dare think you can redeem something that was of Satan. God is God's ways. God's holidays are enough. He gave us seven forever. He didn't mess up and Satan wasn't smarter. And believe me, you're not smarter than God. If you think you can do Christmas instead of the seven of God, um, I would say, dude, wait, you're not smarter than God. Who are you to make your own holidays that you think are better than God's? That God didn't mess up. His holidays are amazing and perfect and wonderful. Okay. So, don't follow these false messiahs because they're going to be so confused. They're like, oh, well, the rapture hasn't happened yet. Oh, there he is. There's the Messiah. There's the Messiah. There's the Messiah. No, we know when he returns. Well, we don't know the day or the hour. Nobody knows the day or the hour. That's the whole thing. That's the whole, that's the whole picture of every, every seventh month on the biblical calendar. It's always exciting because we, have to, we don't know when the holiday is going to be. We're prepared for like three days. You go, did we see the new moon tonight? Oh, no, not tonight. Did we see it tonight? Yay! Blow the show far. We see it. There it is. There it is. There's a sliver of the new moon. Okay. Um, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For the, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Woo, this is talking about a lot of dead bodies there. There's a carcass. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, okay, wait a minute. So after the tribulation, the sun, moon, stars are going to blacken and then the sign of the son of man will appear in heavens. We were told in Zechariah 14 what that sign is. It's the light. The first sliver, like we, we will see light in the heavens that comes. It's him. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. After the day, after the tribulation of those days, then we'll see the sign of the Son of Man. Okay, we can keep reading that, but let's go over to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, this is after the trumpets have already been opened. This is when the bowls of judgment, this is like the seventh trumpet, and we got the bowls coming now, man. We got the bowls on the earth. And here's what Jesus says in, in verse 15. After... Six of the bowls have been poured out upon the earth. Six of the wraths have already come. Two of the woes. Behold, I am coming as a thief. See, he hasn't come yet. He hasn't even come yet at this point. He says, like, after these things, behold, I'm coming as a thief. I'm going to come. This is future tense. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and lest I see his shame. He's like, I haven't come yet yet. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to come as a thief of the night because these people, if you don't know the feast of God, you are going to be surprised when he returns. And you're just going to think we're in the middle of World War III because you're still waiting for a preacher of rapture and you're like, well, this can't be it. Well, 
I can't, this could, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and take this little mark, this insertion, because it can't be the mark of the beast because, well, we're supposed to be raptured out, so this surely isn't it. That's how he's gonna deceive people, people thinking they're gone. And they're gonna take that mark because he's, it says he'll deceive even the elect. Okay. Um, let's go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 says, which we've read this a billion times in the last few weeks, but let's do it again. 13, Revelation 12, verse 13. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That's the Israel, that's the Israelites, the ones who are specifically now, we're talking about the ones who are starting to arise in the year 2000. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nursed for time, times, and half a time. It's three and a half years. These are the 12,000 sealed of each tribe. So into the wilderness to where she is nursed for time, times, and half times from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. The earth opened, the earth, but the earth helped the woman and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed up the flood with the dragon that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman because God says there's this place prepared in the wilderness. We read it also, um, there's twice it says it right here in chapter 12. And we were told that for 12,000 of each tribe were sealed before the tribulation, 12,000 12,000 of each tribe except for the tribe of Dan. That's for chapter 7 here. They're hidden. They're in the wilderness. They're not raptured out. They're hidden and prepared for 20 years. Many of us have been told to get ready and prepare in the wilderness, just so you know. And then the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. This is the good woman and her offspring, not the harlots, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Satan is warring against those who believe in Jesus and keep the commandments of God. They're very much here. There's no preacher of rapture. We are told also in the book of Daniel that he wears out the saints, that he's persecuting the saints. It says, we've read in here, blessed are those who die. There's no preacher of rapture. There's no preacher of rapture. We go through this thing to be refined for our king and for our God. Okay. I think that's summation fairly well of the Babylonian faith system, how the modern Christian church is not biblical. It is the harlot of Revelation 17, 18, and 19. It is the Babylon that you must come out of. I mean, I'm not telling you folks, like, lightly, get out of church. Get out of the modern church system. It is going to get judged by God, and there's a spirit of delusion that the frog's going to go through, it says. Get out before you get confused. I will tell you, you cannot hear the voice of God clearly until you come out. I know it. I experienced it. I mean, I was hearing the voice of God, but as soon as I left, it became clear. And I've heard countless stories, the same thing. Keep trying to go to church on Sunday. Why? Why are you pleasing Satan? Why are you coddling Satan instead of just obeying God faithfully? Be faithful to your husband. Be faithful to your God who loves you, who loves you, who died for you, who sent his son for you. Okay. And then D, the reason Satan's let up, let, locked up for a thousand years is because the Sabbath is a picture of the seventh day on earth. So, I'm sorry, the millennial reign is a picture of the seventh day on earth, the Sabbath under Yeshua reigning. And then at that last battle, because remember in the book of Zechariah, it says some of the nations will still exist and everybody that's left of the nations must come up to the Feast of Jerusalem um, for the Feast of Tabernacles to Jerusalem or else they don't get rain. So there are nations who were still left to be subdued under Yeshua, but then he's let out one more time at the end, and I don't know the why, I guess the full why, but that's what's going to happen, and then Satan will be locked up, and that's when the new Jerusalem descends to the earth. Remember, we don't go to heaven. The new Jerusalem descends here, and then the, you walk through whichever gate of tribe you're in, um, so you better cling to Israel, because otherwise you ain't going in, because they're only labeled with 12 tribes of Israel, and it's the white throne judgment, and our deeds are judged, and the dead, and you know, you get what I'm saying. Okay, that was a pretty intense, like, boom, study. Thank God I got through it. Now, now, I'll just, let's go through and see the questions. Um, no, no, it's not a sin to know multiple languages. They have a temple now, I think it's, well, no, no, no. We have to have a temple in the promised, prophesied mountain. In fact, on the Western Wall, the letters yod heh vav heh three of them have appeared on the Western Wall miraculously since 2020. We know the name, the place God put his name. In fact, he says it all through scripture. He says, Jerusalem is where I put my name. There's no doubt. Dubai is not the temple of God. That's a false temple. That's not God. Um, we can't sin for the, okay, so there we go. I missed your answer. I keep losing volume. Okay, no, Jenna, it's not a sin to know multiple languages. 
is the true Sabbath Saturday or Sunday? The true Sabbath, the biblical Sabbath, the one in the Bible starts Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, okay? And so, um, hi, you guys. Okay, if I've missed your question, let me get to the end here. Catholic and Pro yeah, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Pastor said we don't see the church in line because she was yeah, which is not true, right? We we definitely see the church. She's just called off. They don't want to they don't want to identify that, right? They want to identify as whatever, right? Everybody now I guess can identify whatever they want based on probably the church was the leader of that. Hey, I don't want to identify as the harlot, even though I know it's me. I just don't want to do that. But the church is the harlot. Um Okay, that's absolutely disgusting. So why are we still... Okay. So why are they still there teaching? I'm confused, Daniel, a little bit by that, sweetie, but... No, the term rapture is not in the Bible. It's based on a Greek word. Um, when is the biblical calendar instituted? So the biblical... Hmm, when is it? It was instituted. I'm assuming that you meant past tense. Like, God set up his calendar way back in Genesis. In the book of Exodus, you'll see that he says, this shall be your first, the first of the months for you. That's Exodus, I think, chapter 3. Um, and it's Abib. Abib is it's in the spring. And it's when it's the a word Abib actually means a stage of barley ripeness. It's in the, the, when the barley's in the, head, the green of the head. And there was enough to bring to the, at the, to the Feast of First Roots to offer the first roots of the barley harvest. Yeshua is our first roots from the dead. Isn't that beautiful? Um, so good. Okay, rapture is not in the Bible. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for answering that. This gets me about Italy, I know, right? I'm like, wow, wow. I know you're right. Yep. Well, no rapture. Nope, there is no rapture. He doesn't come back and we meet him in the clouds. I'm confused. Don't we see the dead in Christ? That is at the end of the tribulation. In Zechariah 14, it says Messiah returns to the Mount of Olives, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. The, the, the Mount is split in two. And at that point, he's coming with his saints with him. Now, at that point, there may be where we meet him in the clouds and come down with him. Okay, that's where we meet him in the clouds, like Thessalonians says. But not at the beginning of it. And it's not that we're... We meet him to come down to a battle. We come down to war. Like, that's... We come as the armies of God. That's... In, is, in Hebrew, um, we are called the civil old... Okay, so his name in Hebrew, when Jesus returns, it says we will call him Yahweh Sevaot. That means Lord of Armies. Yahweh of Armies. Sevaot is armies. We're in the armies of God. I mean, we are, we, that's why everything in the Bible is equated to as battle, because we're in a spiritual battle. Okay. Um, right, he will turn to the feast of trumpets, and then those of us who are scattered, like that, we will meet him in the air and then come down. Thank you, Daniel. Um, he, well, he just says, so he comes as a thief in the night, Paul says, only to those who are unprepared. Yeshua's own words right here says, behold, I'm coming as a thief in the night. Keep your garments. The thief in the night means like, um, the, it tells, Paul says, he comes as a thief in the night. And I can't remember the, the which book of the Bible it is right now. But he says, he comes as a, as a thief in the night to those unprepared. But you are not unprepared. He literally makes a juxtaposition of the believers. Because we're not unprepared. We're supposed to be living each day. The thief in the night means like the flood. But does it come as a thief in, did it come as a thief in the night to Noah? No, Noah was prepared. If you're listening to God, you're prepared. But when you are not prepared for the tribulation because you've been told as a preacher of rapture, whew, that's pretty that that right there is pretty scary. And then the whole world is not even looking for him. To those people it says Paul says it comes as a thief in the night, but you are not unaware. You are not the ones who are not aware of the seasons and the times. That's what Paul says specifically. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, Daniel, the light bulb, that's what he means when he says I watched and didn't go weary. Okay, I think I just realized there is no preacher bashing for the Lord. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, Tristan. And Tristan, you I had to, like I had to, my whole my family came against me. Oh my gosh, my mom was such a scary person. <laughs> like I'm like a super gentle, like calm, like person, like not like I'm not calm, like I'm very hyper, but I'm very kind. I'm very kind. And my mom would scare that dead back to life. I mean, she was like terrifying at times. And so when I was following the Bible, I would just shake when she'd be near because she came in Bible thumping and telling me all this stuff. But praise God, about three months into my obedience of the Torah, my mother came one time to set me straight, <laughs> get me out of that law, right? And so she came just thumping that Bible, thumping the Bible. And I kept 
Yeshua speaks to me and he'll sit right here when he's speaking and you get really close. And so I turned my ear so I can hear him because he was right here. And um, I kept turning my, she was screaming at me and I'm always respectful to my mom. Like I tried to be very respectful. So I was like, just keeping my mouth shut and just listening to Yahweh what to say. So I turned my face and she screamed at me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm just, I'm just trying to hear what Yeshua is telling me. And she went silent. And I didn't know until she called me later and told me what happened. But she shut up. Like, my mom didn't shut up. She was like one of those women who was pushy and bossy and totally out of line. And I was just like, that was awkward. And so she literally got up and stormed out of the house and slammed the door. And I just hit my knees at the table. And I, I still remember I was wearing my blue denim skirt and a white and blue shirt. And they had... My hair was like to this length and my son was like two or just turned three at the time. And he's like sitting there. My son was so easy going and he's just looking at this whole thing. He's eating. I just remember he was eating corn on the cob. I had grown some corn from the garden. No, I got it at the store. He was, and this is like 19, this is no, 2002. It's 2002. He's just eating. He goes, mommy, why are you sad? Mommy, why are you sad? And I was just had my hands in my face. And I said, Father God, if I am wrong, please teach me. I, I don't have to be right. I, I just want to do your will. Please, Father, anywhere I'm wrong, teach me. And if my mom's wrong, teach her. Please help us just to see your truth right now. And I was just sobbing. That's all I kept saying over and over the same words. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call. See, I'm the mom who over said sorry. My husband said I did it wrong. Because I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My mom, you weren't going to hear sorry from her. Like, there was no sorry out of her mouth. And she calls me, and she's shaking. And I saw the phone number and I cringed as like, and we didn't have cell phones, but it was like a landline. We didn't have cell phones back then. And I was just like, oh, oh, it's my mom. I got to answer. It's my mom. It's like, yeah, they help me. So I answered the phone. I was like, hello. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, am I going to get screamed at more? I've just been screamed at for like an hour and a half. And I was like, hello. And she goes, Mel, you were right. And I was like, my God, I literally about died. I was like, I sat there for a few seconds. I was like, what do you mean? She said, and, oh, and God had had me told, to tell her a few words. And she said, you know, Mel, she said, when I screamed at you and said, what were you doing? And you said you were listening to Yeshua. She goes, all of a sudden, I knew he was standing right there in the room with us. See, my mom has a very, was a very strong prophetic gift. At that point, though, I had not awakened in her. Well, she didn't understand it, but she knew. She goes, I knew he was standing right behind you. She goes, I could feel him. And then he told me to tell her, how are you different from the world? How are you different from the non-believers? That's the words he said to me. And that's, that's, those are the last words I spoke. And then she slammed the door and ran out. And she goes, Mel, do you don't know this, but 20 years ago, God told me to obey the law. I went to Pastor Bob and he said, we don't have to. So I didn't do it. She goes, I am so sorry. I am wrong, and God tried to tell me this 20 years ago, and I wasn't strong enough or obedient enough to follow. She goes, but God just came to me and told me I was wrong. And I mean, I've never, my mom at that point in her life, now after that she had changed, but at that point in my life, I don't, I don't know if my mom knew how to say the words I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not even joking. And so, I mean, it was just, I don't even know where I was going with that story, but it was just a beautiful thing where it's just, you're gonna be hated, um, you're going to be persecuted. Your family's going to come against you. That's what I was going to say, Tristan. Um, that's what I was talking about. I, like, let me scroll up. What was I talking about? Um, they're going to come against you, but I was willing for my mom to walk out of my life forever. I was willing for my husband to divorce me. I mean, there were some things. I don't want to say some things that happened, <laughs> but I mean, I was cowered on the ground being screamed at, and I, I was kind of like hoping he'd leave. <laughs> I was like, Lord, you can just let him leave me. I'll just serve you. I love you. It's just me and you. We got this. We got this. I don't need a man. I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. I just got you, Lord, right? <laughs> and the Lord will be like, pray for his heart. I'm like, right, pray, pray, right, right, right. Pray that he repents, Lord. <laughs> you know, but when you're in the middle of being like completely bah, bashed, I know the feeling. But I never compromised. I never sinned. I never, ever did one sin for my husband against my God. And God honored that, and my husband respected it. He said that's what convicted him and taught him that my faith was real. 
He goes, because everybody else compromises. He goes, if you had given in to me and done Christmas for me, he goes, I would have thought your faith was not real at all. He goes, I would have thought that God, this whole thing was just made up of religion again. He goes, but your rigid steadfastness to never compromising or sin, he goes, I knew there was a difference. So you need to stand strong no matter what your family does because that's the only way they're going to see a difference because the true believers in God do not compromise. They die for their faith. They lose their families for their faith. Everything can be taken from them and they will not curse their God. They hold to their God. That's the true believer. So you guys stay strong because you're true believers. Um, praise Yahweh. Um, yes. Praise Yahweh. Okay, guys, I'm sorry for the closeness. I'm just reading the comments and the questions to make sure if there's anything I need. Um, when he says no, doesn't he mean into like the husband and wife? I'm not sure what that was referring to, sweetie. You're going to have to ask it again and tell me what you were referencing. We must be absolutely his. Exactly. We can't divorce, though. Acts 10 and 10, they were explained about the clean versus unclean. Um, so, well, Acts 10, no, you're, you're misunderstanding. You're misunderstanding that, Susan. That's not true at all. So Acts 10 literally is talking about Gentile believers. So let's look at this because this is where Christians just twist things out of line. It, we just went through the whole Bible and showed the whole, whole Bible the story. So now you can't take one verse and try to fit thousands of verses through it and say, oh, see, you can eat people now if they die. I mean, that doesn't even work, right? So here's what we're going to say. So here's the thing. Acts 10, Peter's vision. Three times. This is eight years after Jesus died and rose from the dead. Eight years. Okay, so Peter's there up waiting for his food. At the same point, Cornelius had sent three Gentiles to Peter because God had came in a vision to him and said, hey, send to Peter. He needs to help you understand, to help you understand some things. So eight years. And Peter says, Peter sees his vision three times. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, oh no, no, Lord, nothing common around that. Peter hadn't eaten a pig yet. People, Peter hadn't eaten poop, people, or poison at that point. He was not eating unclean things. Peter gets up and says, I wondered what the vision meant. He didn't say, oh, give me a ham sandwich now. He said, I wondered what it meant because he knew God would never speak against the Torah. Just like Joseph knew his brothers weren't going to turn into sheaves of wheat or stars in the heavens. But guess what? It was symbolic. Just like all other visions in, the, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Like he didn't turn into a statue of gold. It was symbolic. Just like Peter's food vision was about Gentiles. And so then three times this happens, eight years after Jesus rose and died from the dead. Peter still had not eaten any pork or anything at this point, And he never did because he never sinned. And, and then he says, he wondered what it meant. And then it says, the Gentiles came. And then he tells us the interpretation himself twice. So do not add to the word of God. Do not add to the word of God. You know what the word of God says? God told me to call no Gentile common or unclean. God didn't say to Peter, get up and you can eat whatever now. Peter would have said, oh, God was telling me in the vision that I can eat anything I want. That is not at all what Peter said. What Peter says is, God told me to call no Gentile common or unclean. Then I understood the vision. If he had to understand it, he knew it wasn't about food. If it was about food, he wouldn't have had to understand it because it would already been clear. The understanding came in understanding that the Gentiles could come to God. And then, I don't know what you're referencing in, in um, Timothy 4, but let's look. Sorry, I get worked up about this stuff, guys. I like this. This is like, this is my candy. <laughs> this is my candy. I love the word of God. I love God. Um, but there's nothing ever, that, I mean, and nobody has ever been able to show us this. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is talking about the Catholic Church. This is, again, a misquote. Look at this. Notice the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Do you think God's a demon? If you say his laws are bad, then you're calling him a demon, and that's blasphemy. God's laws said not to eat pork. God's laws said not to eat human. You going to call him a demon? I don't want to take that up with a big man. I don't want to be standing near you when that lightning bolt strikes people. Woo! That pastor says that, you get back because it says deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. If you equate the law of God with a demon and his laws as demonology, then you are sinning and you are wicked and you have a wicked heart. That is wrong and we don't want to do that. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot fire. So let's read in context. What is he talking about? Timothy is talking about Forbidding to marry. Oh, wait, the priests can't marry in the Catholic Church, can they? This is all talking about the Babylonian system, guys. Doctrines of demons. They say you can't marry. And commanding to abstain from foods. Food in Hebrew is ohel. Flesh is basar. Pig is not food. Isaiah 65 and 66 says, If you are caught eating swine flesh when Jesus returns the second time, you will be destroyed. 
Paul is not telling Timothy contrary to that. He is saying these Catholics who say you can only eat fish on Fridays, abstain from these foods created by God to be sweet. Food is not pig. Food is not human. Food, flesh is human. Flesh is pig. Food is ochel. Food is what's found in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. So if God gave you food, food like deer, here's your food. He already tells us what the food is, the ochel, ochelim. You can't eat rabbit. That's not food. That's flesh. Don't eat that flesh. But here's the food you can eat. This is food for you, ochel. Different words. You better know what you're talking about. So they command to abstain from foods which God created to be received a thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. If was, so do you think you could roast me? This is talking again, like we've talked about when we went through Romans. There are things in the context of the framework of what he's talking about. So he's talking about food. If it is food, you can receive it with thanksgiving. You can eat food. Judaism has a law that if you come from the marketplace eating with unwashed, if you eat with unwashed hands, Mark chapter 7, Matthew chapter 15, if you come from the marketplace and you eat with unwashed hands, they say you defile the food. Jesus says, no, 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 that's a commandment of men. That's a teaching of men. Keep, he goes, why do you set aside the commandments of God to hold your traditions of men? The commandments of God already told us what was food. This is talking about food. Every creature, do you really think God is saying do you, I mean, do you really think Paul is meaning every? We already pointed out through the book of Romans where he says all, but he's not. All things are lawful for me. Really? It's okay to murder? Really? It's okay to have homosexuality? Use our heads. What is he talking about? Within the framework of the law, these things that are beneficial. The word in Hebrew, so Hebrews are very dramatic with their language. So every creature of God, so Paul is above God. He just said, He's talking about food. So everything that's food, every creature that was intended to be food is to not be, you don't have to refuse that. You can eat it. Catholics and other religions, for example, Hinduism. Hindus say you can't eat cows, right? Do you get what I'm saying? This is, he would never, if you believe that it's a deceiving spirit that told God's people to not eat pig, then you've got a problem. You've got a problem because you don't believe in the right God. That's not a deceiving spirit or a doctrine of a demon. How dare you equate, how dare, not you, I'm not saying you, I'm saying, I'm saying generalities here, please don't take this wrong. The person that would say that the law of God was a demonic teaching, that person is demonically possessed. Because that person is, that's insane. God is God, Yahweh is God, he's supreme, his knowledge, even Paul says, do we nullify the law of grace? Heaven, no, heaven forbid we uphold it. We, 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 we do it. Every word that proceeded from the mouth of God is good. Okay, so I, I wasn't even coming at you, Susan, on that. I'm just coming at that thought process is what I was thinking. That I just realized, I hope you don't think I'm just attacking her. I'm not trying to attack you. I'm that thought process. I'm trying to break through the strongholds. Every creature that is food, if I eat, if I die, do you really think you could eat me? Because if by that, if you're going to say, oh, you can eat pig now, then first of all, you're coming against Isaiah 65. Do you believe Isaiah is a prophet? So then you can't believe any of Isaiah. You're going to have to say you can't believe Isaiah because Isaiah 65 and 66 says when Jesus comes back the second time. Then you can't believe anything in the Old Testament that says the law will stand forever for any native born or Gentile. You can't believe that. So basically you don't have a Bible anymore. You can't believe anything. You just have this one verse. You just have maybe like three verses that will work for you if you do enough theological gymnastics. That's just not biblical. That's just not right. So we understand when we read, when Paul says, all things are lawful for me, he's not telling you to murder or be homosexual. He's not telling you to commit adultery. And if you think that, then you've really got a problem. So we have to understand just like the same things here. Every creature God created, right? But every creature that God created for food is what he's implying. He's already talking about food. Okay, hope that made sense. So I got a little intense on that one. I like it. I like, like this stuff. Hey guys, I'm just reading questions right now to make sure. Um, I have been taking pagan worship out of our lives. Thank you. Good job, Tristan. First was Easter Christmas. They made me suffer because I've been taking away. Awesome. Keep doing it, girl. And you, you know, you can do you and your light for your family. You can't force them, but you do it. We are, we are, we, sorry. Oh, hi, Heather. Hi, Spencer. Um, I hope somebody answered that because I wasn't looking at any comments until I got done. Um, 
Okay. I want to go. Yes, there is so much. Pre-trade writers. Right. It's a lie, isn't it, Marie? It's a very dangerous lie. It's a very dangerous lie. Especially the fact that like, once you know that you're Israel, once you understand that the ten other tribes of Israel are there and they're the they're the church that you're being called out, then you're gonna realize, oh <laughs> then you realize you're an Israelite, then you're like, Oh, it is for me. <laughs> God wants to refine me to be holy for him. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, is Hebrew calendar based on solar? Okay, so the Hebrew, the biblical calendar is to be go going off the new moon sighting. We can prove that so many ways, but the most obvious one is Zechariah chapter 14 because it coincides with the festival of Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day of the seventh month, which is the prophecy, the prophetic period of Yeshua's returning. And so we know that, that that's the sliver of the new moon. Now, all... Bibli so biblical records show there's and li don't listen to these new modern theories the earth is not flat there's i mean there's so many weird stuff out there get in the bible get in scripture and sit at the feet of yeshua because he is your teacher he's your god somebody call me teacher today i'm like oh whoa, 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 whoa. no 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 nope that's yeshua yeshua is the teacher i'm just working with him he speaks through me just to help you you are supposed to have that relationship with god you need to know him he's your teacher i'm not i'm not i mean some i have the gift of teaching but i'm not the teacher He's the teacher. And so um, we go off the visible new moon side in the Karaite Jews who were anti, they were anti-Talmud. They wanted to say sola scriptura. They always tried to keep everything biblical based and just what the Torah said. They've always done it by the new moon sighting. And it's the only way that makes sense when you look at scriptural things, especially Zechariah 14. Hope that makes sense, sweetie. Okay. Did, Daniel, did you link the podcast? I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, if I'll send it to you, go to your magnifying glass in the top of Facebook and type in Godzilla. Oh, that's okay. Actually don't, because that only takes you to the Facebook page. I don't re ever remember to post on my Godzilla Hummingbird Facebook page. Please don't even follow that page. <laughs> well, you can follow it, but it's not going to do you any good because I never remember to put things on there. But I will, Karen, I will, um, I will send you a link. Let me make a note. Send Karen podcast link because okay how can we possibly the liberty of the earth in place because it says it says for the sake of the elect those days will be shortened it says you will in the book of revelation we read it last night um it, uh, revelation 12 it says right there they will well there was a part yeah they will hunger no more and thirst no more i think it, it's not right that section it's going to be tough we're going to come through it, but he says he is going to bring us to it. In Joel chapter 2 or 3, he says during the tribulation, he would be a shelter to his people. Let me find it for you so I can see if it's Joel 2 or 3. Um, he's going to be a shelter to us. He told people to, pre to prepare. Um, we're, it's, okay, so we're told in Gen <laughs> Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23. This is called the second exodus, what is coming. So please make note of that, Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23. The second exodus is coming. It says it will be so great we won't talk about the first exodus. You'll see that in both things. And this time he's going to recover his children from the land of Assyria to which they've been scattered. Okay, they've been driven away through Assyria. He's going to bring them back. In the second exodus, um, he's going, like he says in the book of Micah, that we will come, I think it's Micah chapter 5, he will bring us out with many signs and wonders again, just like to the first exodus. So remember, the first exodus was pretty tough. All those plagues were hitting Egypt. Well, we're going to be covered and protected during those the plagues coming against um, the world, the tribulation, the bowls, the judgments, and stuff like that. However, it does say some of us will give our life, and it does say Satan will, try, will come against us. It says some of us will be, like, martyred, so to speak, for him, um, and it's going to be tough. It says those, so there's a woman, and then there's the daughter, and it says the daughter will hunger no more and thirst no more. That means she's going to be hungry and thirsty. It's going to be tough. You better train for the war now. You better get off the couch, the spiritual couch, and you better prepare how to stay faithful, how to stay joyful. Even in, like the book of Habakkuk says, like even if the seed shrivels in the barn, I will just praise you, Father God. Even if we have no food, even if the animals are dead, even if everything's bad, we're going to praise you. We have to learn how to praise him. Um, let me look at Joel where it says, I think it's chapter 3. Maybe not. Yeah, I think it's chapter 3. Oh, yeah. Ch um, Joel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Yahweh will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And that's talking about during the day of the Lord, okay? I hope that helped. 
Okay, thank you. I didn't know it was on there. I, but Karen, um, the Put God First, Barney Latner Karen, I'm going to send you a link because, thank you, awesome, so you got love. I have had multiple dreams. That's awesome. So Tristan, that's probably very symbolic of like, it's going to get tough and you're going to have just a little provi few provisions. Get your pack pack ready. You're going to be fleeing. Um, Okay, guys. Um, no, I meant the ads in the Catholic have a building somewhere on the moon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> good. Because I was like, oh. Okay, good. Thank you, Tristan, for clarifying that. Because I'm like, oh, that's not the temple. Don't don't even think about that. That's Ezekiel 40 tells us. Okay. Can you repeat the Feast of Tabernacle, not an exact date, when the Bible? Okay. Can you repeat the Feast of Tabernacle, not an exact date, where in the Bible scripture? So the Feast of Tabernacles is talked about Leviticus 23. Also, Zechariah 14 um, talks about when Messiah returns, that we must go to Jerusalem every year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles or else we won't get rain. So those two places, Leviticus 23, Zechariah 14. There's a place in Numbers, too, that really details a lot of it, too. Um, oh, in Deuteronomy. No, Leviticus 23, not Deuteronomy. Daniel, it's Leviticus 23. The Abrahamic family house of the Catholic mother. Oh, Yeah. Thanks, Christina, for clarifying what she was talking about. So my friend tonight said Paul and James contradict each other. They don't. They don't. No, they don't. They don't. Paul and James. People misunderstand Paul greatly, which is why I went through. So go to the podcast, the God's Little Hummingbird podcast. I go through the book of Galatians, just like we did tonight. Remember how I showed you in Galatians chapter 4? It definitely isn't talking about not returning to God's holidays. It's talking about not returning to the pagan holidays. I mean, we made that very clear if you look at the language. Um, now, I was a grammar teacher, a literature teacher, so I don't know if that helps because I see a lot of people who just have a confusion. But what God told me, like with the, flat, with the flat earth and some of these things getting out there with these weird calendar theories, Yahweh told me that's a spirit of stupor that some of his people got put under. And then there's also, I just think some people can't comprehend because if I, we went, we went through Romans together the other night, right? And it's like, there's a blindness there, isn't there? Like until, well, the Bible says until you turn to Messiah, the blindness, the veil lies over their heart when they read the law of Moses. That's in the New Testament. And I really believe that that happens to people. And when you turn to Messiah, he takes that blinders off, which he's doing with you guys. But it's weird because I think that some people, like they twist scripture so badly because I don't think they're teachable. I don't, I, I guess I just don't understand why they do it. I don't understand why they just can't see. Cause I see Paul clearly says to obey the law. Go through our study. I think I sent it to you, Audrey. The Romans one is like, Paul says to obey the law. First Corinthians, he says to obey the law. First Corinthians 7, 19 is very obvious. He says to obey the law. So I hope that. Where is the feast? We don't know the other time. So that one's the Feast of Trumpets. It's called Yom Teruah. It's in Leviticus 23. It's a day or hour we don't know. Um, we have to look for the visible new moon study because here's how we know. For, this, for the first day of the seventh month, we always had to wait for the new moon sighting. Zechariah 14 says it, it's that the, um, at neither day nor night and hour only the Lord knows that evening it shall happen that the light shall return. That's referencing that feast. I hope that makes sense. That might be too much. Um, could you describe the full armor of God with your eloquence of speech? I don't know if I'm so eloquent in my speech. I'm a little tired and fluffling, like fluttering with my tongue tonight. So Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the whole armor of God. And so, just to walk through it, because you have the helmet of faith. So the interesting thing is, in the book of in the book of Psalms, it says, um, "Isaiah, um, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my lawgiver." Who did we just say Ephraim was? Well, the ten hundred tribes of Israel who got scattered through Europe. What is the helmet? The helmet of salvation. Isn't it interesting that Paul is quoting things from the Tanakh? And if you don't know the Old Testament, you won't see what he's talking about. But what he says is put on your helmet of salvation. He understood that Yeshua is the helmet of salvation, right? And that is what he understood. I, um, the Psalms understood. I, um, Ephra, it was the prophecy that Ephraim was going to have the helmet of salvation. They were going to know who Jesus was, that he's the salvation. And Judah was going to be the lawgiver. So just Google it, you'll find it. There's two verses, two sections that say it. So it says, Judah is my lawgiver, Ephraim is my helmet. The other option word there. So you put on your, the helmet of salvation. Well, so your brain, everything must function as the Messiah functions. He is the head of the body. He is the one to be directing your thoughts, your eyes, your words, your ears, what you hear, everything. And then you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, this is all symbolizing things from, now we have the breastplate. 
um, well, that is very much linked to the priesthood, right? But it protects your heart. Your heart must, out of your heart flows wickedness. So here you have a protection to protect that wickedness, the breastplate of righteousness. What is righteousness? To do rightly, to do what is the right thing, which is the Torah, the commandments of God. So when you have the right heart, you're going to be, when you follow the Torah, it says because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. So if you're obeying the law of God, you're going to have love, right? The converse of that is that you're going to have love. And so then when you guard your heart with the commandments of God, you're filled with love, mercy, truth, peace, and grace. So boom. And then so you have on the belt of truth. So your waist is your center, your, your, your middle part. You have to have truth to be the very substance of what you are. And that holds the money bag there, which is your treasure, right? Your treasure is the word of God. Your, the truth is your treasure, wisdom, the fear of God, the things like I want to stand in truth. Revelation 21 says, is it 21 or 22? He who loves and practices a lie will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So if you are trying to keep Sunday as a Sabbath, that's a lie. You're loving it and practicing it. You don't even get to go to heaven. It says in, um, so be careful because I don't want to take that chance. I'm not saying you can't go to heaven. I'm saying the scripture says you don't get to go to heaven. So I don't know. I don't want to argue with that. I don't want to argue with that. If you love and practice a lie, Oh, wait, Jesus wasn't born at Christmas. That's a huge lie. So he who loves and practices a lie won't enter kingdom of heaven. Oh, that's a big lie to pretend Jesus was born at Christmas. Oh, Easter, that's a big lie because Easter wasn't about Jesus' resurrection, but Feast of First Fruits surely was. Hmm, he who loves and practices a lie are outside. They don't get to go in. I don't, I don't want to love and practice a lie. So you have to have the belt of truth. Then your um, shield of faith, the, the item not even reading here, so I hope I'm not missing anything. Um, you have to have faith. We've been talking about faith so much intensely this week, especially with the healings, the medicine, the gifts, the, the spiritual aspects. Your faith has to be incredible. If you heard a story last night, if you didn't see last night's live, please go on. A huge story of Lee's faith that was just, oh, so beautiful. And she was healed from a broken back <laughs> because of what we've been talking about. She decided to have faith, stepped out, prayed. She felt a tingling sensation through her body and her back was healed. She's like, I haven't had, not had back pain for years. Also, I'm free of pain. I'm healed. Beautiful story. But that's that shield of faith because Satan is constantly trying to make you doubt your faith. First of all, he's going to doubt you. Oh, did God really forgive you? God can't forgive you. You're too wicked and you're too wretched of a person. Or he's going to say things like, oh, did God really say not to eat pork? Pff, you, hey, listen to me. I know better. You remember that tree over there, that tree of knowledge of good and evil? God doesn't know what he's talking about. Go ahead and eat it. You're just, you're just going to be really smart. Go ahead and don't listen to God. God doesn't know what he's talking about. No, God did know what he's talking about, <laughs> right? So you have to have that shield of faith, the word of God, to boom. If Satan comes at you and says, you can eat ham now, say, uh, no, no, thank you. I don't want to be destroyed when he comes back. And God already said, no, no. God said, no, boom. Hey, you can do Christmas. Just accept a few presents here. No, no, no. God said obedience is better than sacrifice. Boom, no, no. Bounce off those thoughts of Satan that are coming at you. And then the sword is when you're speaking truth into this world and you're defeating the enemy with the word of God. Say, Yeshua quoted scripture against Satan. Satan quoted scripture to Yeshua. And so then you have to have your feet prepared with sandals to share the gospel. Your feet are shored with the sandals. That means everywhere you go, I'm not even joking. If you're at a park, if you're at a grocery store, if you're at a gas station, you better be sharing because the Bible says, blessed is he who sows by many waters. Blessed because you don't know what's going to come up. I mean, I'm throwing seeds all over the place. Tonight was the most incredible thing. Um, I knew that I was supposed to, these people asked me to take Christmas photos. Of course, what do I say? I'm sorry, I don't take Christmas photos, but I will take winter photos or just family photos for you. So please, no tree, nothing with Santa, nothing with Rudolph. I won't take those photos. I don't do that, but I will definitely take your photos. They still chose me. <laughs> I'm always, I said, feel free to discriminate. I tell people, Feel free to, I didn't say it with this group, but, which I don't know why, because I usually do. I say, feel free to discriminate against me. You do not have to choose me as your photographer, but here are the parameters under which I function. I've had homosexual couples ask me to take their photos. Here, I said, here are the parameters under which I will function. I said, I will not photograph you as a couple. I will not photograph you as a family because that family unit is not what is honored by God. I said, I love you and I'll photograph you individually as people. I will do individual photos, but not as a family unit. I said, feel free to discriminate against me. And they've still chosen me sometimes. I will not compromise and do something that's sinful. People have asked me to do all sorts of things in life. I'm like, no, here's my parameters. You can discriminate against me. And so, I don't even know where I was going with that. Sorry, I lost my thought because I saw a comment. See, that's the thing. That's the thing with me. But, um... 
I don't even know. Oh, the story tonight. Sorry. So then what was happening was, um, so these people, they chose me anyway. And they were a beautiful couple, beautiful, beautiful new baby. And they love God. Like I could tell they were God's children. I knew when I got it because I always pray. I said, Father God, I only want like, I just want the clients that are your people that you want me to share with. Like, I just want to share with your people. And so, cause I just want to love on his people and bless them and, and whatever. So I knew they were believers and I knew they loved God. And sure enough, they did. And, um, we got to talk like after, after the session, we just got talking and these people like really have a heart for God. And so share, like I'm sharing, I've made some people pretty mad at me, but most of the time people are like listening because I'm a very kind person. So be kind when you share, don't be like you stupid just be like, I mean, I got a little intense there earlier. And I was realizing, oh, I just not mean it to Susan. I mean it to the system. So Aubrey, Audrey can hear like what we say against that system of lies. Um, I don't want to come against somebody, but um, like in person, I'm just like, you know, sharing and kind. And <laughs> I had one person. Yeah. Anyway, be kind when you share, be kind. Like Yeshua was kind. He just spoke matter of factly. He's like, yeah, well, technically, you know, Satan's your, you know, Yeshua wasn't yelling or being angry. He's like, yes, Satan's your dad. Like, you're not really Abraham's children. You're not. And I, you guys that hear me on here, sometimes I'll say things like, yeah, that's just demonic. That's just wrong. Like, I have to call a spade a spade, but I don't have to be mean about it. I hope that makes sense. Hi, Francis. Missed you guys. Didn't you surely tell you, ask your mom how she's different from the world? Yes. Been busy. Okay. This was a good study. Um, whoever just turned in there. Francis, go back and listen to it tomorrow, honey, if you can. Totally agree, but most of the time I hear that wives are taught to submit to their husbands, even if it means going, I get it, Susan. Um, but that's what they tell you. That's not what God tells you. Abigail was blessed for her obedience to God over her obedience to Nabal. Nabal was like, who's David and his man? I ain't going to help them out. Abigail was like, holy cowabunga, this is bad. My husband was evil. She disobeyed him, sent food. That's what sent him into a stroke because it made him so angry. You know, he got mad that his wife did that, but she was blessed and got to be the wife of David, who's a symbol of Yeshua. So always obey God first. Always obey God first. And who can, you will not get, you're not going to get less punishment just because your husband told you. you were, God was like, but I put you there to be the, like, I put you there. You're supposed, like, you, you need to listen to me. You were to be a witness to him and help him overcome his sin. Why did you just go along with his sin? So just remember to stand up and be bold, okay? Exactly. Right, Danielle. Okay, we must put God. When we went to Catholics, they were eating unclean. Was he able to eat with him at the table? When he went to Cornelius, they were eating unclean. He, he, they weren't eating unclean. It doesn't say they were eating unclean. Cornelius was a man of God. Cornelius was learning God's ways. They weren't eating unclean. A man of God would have known that. Cornelius knew to go to Jerusalem. If you look at the Feast of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 1, it says people, not Jews, people from all over the world were at Jerusalem for the feast. Any Gentile was a believer from, we talked about Exodus 12, Numbers 15, Leviticus 19, Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 56, Ezekiel 47. There has always been the same, so Caleb was a Gentile. Caleb converted and became the leader of Judah. Ruth was a Gentile. She became an Israelite, okay? So we cannot, Cornelius, he did not, Paul did not eat, Peter did not eat anything unclean with Cornelius when he went there. Cornelius already knew some of God's ways. He was following the Torah. He was following the law. What he didn't understand was that Yeshua was the Messiah. He didn't know that Messiah had come. So then they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know Paul was given his vision? It's, go look it up. It says, Ananias, a man devout according to the law. And it says it two times. The man sent to give Paul his sight was not a lawless Gentile, was not a lawless Jew, was not a lawless person. It says, Ananias, go to Paul, lay your hands on him. Ananias is like, oh my gosh, this man is killed. I've heard such bad things about him, Lord. And the Lord's like, no, go to him. He must know what he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul says twice, Cornelius, um, Ananias, a man devout according to the law. According to the law, devout. Okay. So good questions. Can you eat deer? Yes, 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 yes. Don't eat scavengers. Yes, that's a good, that's a good analogy. Can you please explain when Yeshua sent out his disciples and told them to eat whatever they put in front of them? I know he didn't mean pig. Yes. Okay. So Danielle, in where were they going? 
again, this is like what we're talking about. Paul, when he said, all things are lawful for me, he's definitely not telling you to murder, commit adultery, or homosexuality, right? He is not, I mean, we, we gotta use logic here. So when he's saying, eats whatever, these are people who they're going, that he says, eat was, he's not saying, he's talking, this is in Romans you're quoting from, I believe. He was ever said before you, um, but if they say this was sacrifice offered to an idol, then don't eat it. Again, read in context of what this was. This isn't saying eat pig. This is saying, because the whole passage there says, um, if somebody tells you this was sacrificed to an idol, you know the idol's nothing, but for the sake of consciousness, don't eat it because then you embolden them to partake in those things. We, we actually went through that together on one of these lives. Remember that? So again, a verse taken out of context can be extremely dangerous because the context of this passage was food sacrificed to idols, okay? So if a food was sacrificed to an idol, God says, don't worry about it. If they offer you something, eat whatever's set before you. But if they tell you it was sacrificed to an idol, then you better not eat it for, the con for their conscience because then, then you're gonna make them stumble. Does that make sense? I think so, guys, right? Yes, the deer is definitely currently in Timothy, one but all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> we're all, who went to Cornelius? Are you talking about Paul? He was sent to a man who, no, Ananias. Who went to, oh, Danielle's responding to somebody else. Hi from Isabel, hi, sweetie. Oh, Denise, I'm sorry. So Denise, it's, it's blue. So Denise, if you can't hear it, sometimes people the next day will refresh it and they'll watch it as the video and then it doesn't cut out, okay? Just so you know. Okay, any more questions, guys? I know this was a really good study tonight, wasn't it? It was awesome how the Lord just showed up and taught. Melissa, so much to you have to Yeah, this video, I would say, save this. If you're new to Torah, I'd say watch this one. Honestly, a lot of our lives, um, especially back a couple weeks ago, like the one through Romans, the one through 1 Corinthians, Romans especially, and the one we went through Hosea, remember, um, a couple Saturday nights ago? Man, don't, yeah, go over them, over and over and over. If y'all want to hear... Oh, did you link that? Okay, I'm going to do the same. Take notes next time. I know. Put me on slow-mo. I dug fast. And reach out. Um, no, actually, Tristan, she's right. <laughs> you can eat giraffe, but I don't want to. You can probably eat grasshoppers, too, but I don't want to. That's the one where I said... <laughs> I know the Lord told me, like, I have to function in the spirit of John the Baptist. He's told me that and then very intensely the last few weeks. I'm like, just don't make me eat grasshoppers. Like, God, I just, I would rather just die. I would rather just go peacefully home. I can starve to death. If that's all it was, I'll just say, thank you. I've lived a good life. I can just piece this out slowly, and you'll just take me home. There are no grasshoppers going in this body. Can't do it. <laughs> like Hosea, or like Ezekiel. No, God, please. No, 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 no. Don't let me, don't make me cook my food over human dung. Please, God, please. And that's me with grasshoppers. Please, God, no. <laughs> please, no grasshoppers. <laughs> Can't do it. Okay. Hi, guys. Okay, any other questions? This was a really good study tonight, wasn't it? I keep seeing that. Yeah, I agree, guys. But you know what I did? I did zero preparation. I remembered this morning that Audrey has a question. I sat down at five, at five, or, 657 quickly looked at what the question was and said god you got to lead <laughs> and he did isn't he good yahweh is so good man he shows up <laughs> no the greater res the second exodus sweetie is actually real exodus um, jeremiah 16 jeremiah 23 it says it's the awakening of a prime it's the coming out of it we are going to leave america we will not live here <laughs> yeshua is coming back and we're all going to the land of israel ezekiel 47 tells us how we will divide that land up and if you're a gentile you get grafted in whatever tribe you choose to sojourn my family we don't get land so i gotta be with yeshua <laughs> i'm excited about that because levi's don't get land my in-laws made spaghetti with deer without my knowledge and asked me. Yeah, deer is actually fine. Okay, I think people do have blinders on. This is my first time actually understanding Torah. I see the word commandments everywhere. Praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh, praise Good dot, put that armor on. How would you witness to those who think scriptures are man-made control and slavery mechanisms? Oh, I see. Um, so... 
Honestly, <laughs> it's hard to reason with them. I mean, honestly, you can't reason with a fool, right? It says argue with a fool and you become a fool like them. You look, you just look like a fool like them. I mean, it's very foolish, right? It's very, very foolish. So I always say the biggest, the biggest proof that our scriptures are very intact and accurate, like is, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls show so much accuracy. They have things that, you know, that they just found manuscripts from the ancient things that are so close. Um, but honestly, and how do you, how do you, how do you argue with a fool? I mean, how do you, some of those arguments are so detrimental, but the most important, the thing that I usually say is, well, I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that there was very little to almost no alteration of any of the original Hebrew scripts, like from <laughs> way back when, like, that's a pretty big discovery that shows that. Like the book of Isaiah was so intact. The book of Isaiah, we went and saw it. We, um, did you guys get to see? Who else got to see the Dead Sea Scrolls? My husband went twice. It was so neat. I went, I got to go once. Um, really neat. Really neat. Um, anyway, I hope that makes sense. But honestly, a lot of those people like that, I just, you can't, Those there's some people like, they're so illogical that it's just really, like nothing you said was going to work anyway. Like, it's just like, because you can be like, well, history books are written by man, yet you read the history book and you believed what they said about World War II. Like a man made that. Like the Illuminati, the higher ups, or not the Illuminati, but whatever it is, they didn't, they didn't change the Bible. I mean, the Bible is so powerful and alive and active. And if they can't experience it, then that's on them. And just, it just comes down to a matter of faith, whether you have to commit or not. And like, I mean, like I said, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are a pretty good indication um, pray just for divine appointments. Exactly. I didn't even understand what Torah was. I'm so glad you do now. I didn't either. So amazing. When making the choice to no longer celebrate Christmas, is there a way to just be a blessing to people or even your children? Maybe not specifically on the day, but any day? Is it this? Is it the same if it's not on Christmas? I love Okay, so what we do, Nikki, I don't accept Christmas presents and I don't give Christmas presents. The Father told me not to because they're tainted and he says in your... That's the food sacrifice to idols. He goes, you're emboldening their, you're, you're emboldening their conscience to do things which are actually against God. So if you accept a Christmas present, you're saying, well, I'm saying it's wrong, but I'll still accept it from you. And that's why the Bible talks about what we just talked about with Danielle. You don't eat something if somebody says, hey, this was sacrificed to an idol for their conscience sake. You don't do it because that emboldens them to continue in the bad behavior. And so we just don't do anything because you're, you, right now you, you don't have to make, be nice to people. You have to be faithful to God. Like your whole focus right now is about being faithful to God and loving people. And love will set them free from sin. Love turns them from unrighteousness to righteousness, okay? And so, and so when, if you want to do benevolent gifts, you should do it every day. Like God will put people on your heart. You should give gifts every day, not around Christmas season, not at Christmas season. Do anytime God says, hey, I want you to bless this person with some food today. I want you to go ahead and have a family dinner. Just say, let's just have a family dinner because... You don't have to have a reason to do it. You can just say because, but just definitely don't do it then and don't coddle them and don't do it at that time because then you are emboldening their conscience to sin. Okay. Yes, I will listen tomorrow. Okay, and do not tell me this is it's your wife or something. Exactly. Good job, Danielle, putting that in there. Um, actually, Danielle, that was... Yeah, you got it. Yeah, uh, well, I encouraged her to do like Sabbath gifts too, yeah, because... I like to do Sabbath gifts because I want Sabbath to be so special and holy. And so, like, I'll, <laughs> I'll get my husband, like, Sabbath things, little Sabbath presents. Or, like, my son, when he was little, now he's going to be 25. And so he hasn't lived at home for seven, almost eight years. But I get little gifts. Sometimes I used to get them for the children. I still do sometimes get the children gifts on the Sabbath and just give them little prizes just to be happy on the Sabbath. <laughs> um, okay. I tell my family, if you want to give, feel free to do it anytime. Just don't wait a certain day. Yeah, exactly. That's a good job. That's good. You guys are amazing. Yes, if Father puts someone on your heart to give them. Exactly. Cover that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so my favorite, if y'all want to know. So I like that um, equal exchange, dark chocolate mint. It's all kosher, all organic. It's like 60 some percent chocolate. So if you ever want to bless, <laughs> totally teasing. And the HU chips that are sugar free, they only have like dates in them. Those are amazing. Cover them in that chocolate. Cover them in yummy, good chocolate. Oh, and then that equal exchange, 
I think it's Eclipse Exchange. They have a like an 88% dark chocolate. That one's really good too. I wonder if John the Immerser dipped the locusts in honey. Well, I don't know, but I ain't gonna know because I looked into ordering a Torah. What version? Should... Okay, so the Torah, sweetie, is just Genesis to Deuteronomy. Be careful of some of the modern Torah books, so, so to speak, because they're filled with Judaism laws in the bottom of them. Um, and so you don't need a special book because the Torah just means Genesis to Deuteronomy. Isn't that cool? Chocolate covered grass. Ugh. Don't even make me vomit. He is so good. Chocolate covered locusts are disgusting. Okay, which verses talk about the second Exodus again? That's Gen um, Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23. Okay, not gonna lie, I was totally, I would totally try. Danielle, you would. Crunchy. Oh, so HU chocolate chips. Oh my gosh, I don't know what they stand for, um, but they're all kosher. And so I don't, I try not to eat sugar a lot. Like, I, I like I have a tiny, tiny bit, like probably less than half a teaspoon a day. If I try not to just have sugar. We're too, I'm too old, I'm almost 50. I like to run. I like the way my joints feel when I'm healthy. You know what I'm saying? I just, I like to not have the sugar. Um, so I find things that don't have sugar. And so I use dates or stuff like that. And, and um, H-U, they're like chocolate chips. They're right in Walmart. I find them right there. And they're just like dark chocolate. And there's no, I don't do a erythritol and that false sugar stuff. I, ugh, that makes me feel sick. So... I can't remember what's in them. It's just like chocolate and dates. And that's like it. And it's so good. Yeah, they are delicious. I sent Danielle some the other day. Okay, awesome, guys. Any other questions before we sign off? I know this was a lot. Audrey, did it help? Do you think this will help? I think it will. I mean, gosh, th this study was so intense tonight. I loved it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I thought it was really good. <laughs> um, if you have questions, reach out. I'm just thinking, because I don't even think I did it. Because obviously I didn't plan anything. That was all Yahweh, just putting things that kept coming, bouncing in my head. Praise Yahweh. So we're going to end. Father God, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray that your word does not become return void. I pray, Father God, that we would be humble, obedient, submissive. Please circumcise our hearts to you. Please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to comprehend. Father God, do not let Satan fill our soil in our hearts with weeds. Do not let him block out our or, or, or the sun's scorch your word, but may we have good soil in our hearts where we receive your word and it grows and bears such such a bountiful harvest of your Holy Spirit. Father God, please be glorified in our life. Teach us your way. Please help us to be lights for you. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your son. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you, Father God, for everything you do. Please save your children. Please deliver us. Please help in the name of Yeshua. I beg. Amen. And we say together, God just spoke to me because this morning he told me I was going to say something to you guys and I just forgot it until just now. And he said, Melissa, I want you to speak. Come, let my people go. I mean, to let, not to say come, he said, let my people go. So today, will you join me guys? Can we put our hands up to the pharaohs of this world, the religious systems of this world, the lies of this world, and can we just say together, let God's people go let my people go, says Yahweh. Let my people go from your religion, from your indoctrination, from your Babylonian system. Let my people go, says Yahweh. Let them worship me, says Yahweh. Let them exalt my name and not taint their tables anymore with demons. May they not taint their tables with demons. May they only sit at the table of righteousness. Let my people go, says Yahweh. Ooh. Oh, please. Pray that everywhere I go. I'll drive down the street a lot, guys, and I just pray, let God's people go. I pray all the religious systems, all the churches, I'm praying it all the time. My hands are, let God's people go, let my people go. Ooh, my hands are like burning right now. I knew, like, as soon as I, he's reminded me I was going to pray, he's like, totally is there. So I know. Yahweh, yeah, we just pray in the name of Yeshua. Let, let your people go, God, please. Please command pharaohs, please command these religious systems to let your people go. We speak, let Yahweh's people go. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. Hmm. He's good. Yes, let us go. Exactly, get us out. Baby Bean always says, let my people go. Oh, that's beautiful. Awesome. Guys, pray that everywhere you go, pray it all the time. Speak it into this world. Fish like never before. Please don't think you're not worthy. Don't think you're not smart enough. You know enough. You know enough to at least start 
If you don't know everything, that's fine. You fish, you land them on the shore, help, get one of us to help you. <laughs> but, you know, if you need to make the landing of the fish, get some help. But speak, share, God will be with you. It says, do not plan, with, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't even, God's going to be with you in that moment. Say, if you're not perfect, guess what? Then nobody would ever speak. I'm not perfect. Danielle's not perfect. Morgan's not perfect. Nellie's not perfect. Tristan's not perfect. Get out there and do it. Do it ugly. Do it messy because the Holy Spirit meets you. Try your best and that's all you can do. Moses wasn't a good speaker. Paul apparently really sucked at speaking. He confused everybody in his letters, <laughs> right? He still did it. And praise God he did. His letters are amazing if you can understand what he's saying. Okay, I love you guys. I got to go edit some sneak peeks of the beautiful family tonight. Then I got to get up and milk some cows. Love you all. Have a blessed night. I'm thankful for you all. I'm so thankful for you all. You have no idea.